I'll wait. People just turn their cell phones on silent or off so they don't disrupt the hearing. We don't want that being picked up on the recording tape. Okay, we are good to go. And uh, Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I am Councilmember Eric Ulrich. I am the chair of the Veterans Committee. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, we are going to be joined by a number of the other members of the committee. I actually saw them on the way up the steps uh, at City Hall, so they'll be in, but there are several other meetings going on, so they may be in and out of today's hearing. Today's hearing will focus on the New York City Department of Veterans Services. Boy, it feels great to say that, doesn't it? Established by Local Law 113 of 2015, which made New York the largest city in the country with a dedicated agency to those who have served in uniform and served our country. DVS, not to be confused with DMV, okay, uh, seeks to expand educational and professional opportunities for veterans and their family members through public, private, and nonprofit partnerships. They also refer veterans to benefits, resources, and services that are available throughout the city of New York and employ an integrative mental health model to promote the physical and mental well-being of veterans and their families in New York City. DVS has been in operation for more than one year. Its current budget stands at roughly $4.4 million, much higher than it was under the Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs, its predecessor. And it recently hired 30 new employees, great employees, I will add at that. In light of those recent changes, this is an ideal time to review the department's rollout, examine the progress of its many initiatives, discuss the needs of the veterans community throughout the five boroughs, and anticipate future challenges that we may face as a city. We have several recent accomplishments to be very proud of such as reaching functional zero in terms of veterans' homelessness, expanding the alternative real property tax exemption for veteran homeowners, and amending the city's human rights law to include uh, current or prior uniform service as a protected class in the context of housing, employment, and public accommodation, and working on issues related to discrimination related to veterans. Uh, however, we know that there's still a lot of work ahead of us and more work to do, and there's always ways to improve existing services to ensure that New York City remains a national leader in terms of veteran-related policy. Today, we're, we will hear from a range of stakeholders, including uh, Dr. Uh, Commissioner Lori Sutton from the administration, uh, service providers, the advocate community, nonprofits, and the general public in the hopes of shedding light on the path that lies ahead for this exciting new department. I would like to thank the committee staff, our counsel, Caitlin Fahey, she's to my right, our policy analyst, Michael Kurtz, he's to my left, uh, the financial analyst, Zachary Harris, uh, also to my left, and my legislative director, uh, Mary Prentice, for their work in making today's hearing. And uh, as I mentioned, I'll interrupt later to recognize uh, which members of the committee have joined us. I see Councilmember Vallone, uh, Paul Vallone from Queens is here, and I know Councilmember Cabrera is also on his way, and Councilmember um, uh, Borelli is also coming upstairs. So why don't we hear from uh, the administration? And before I ask the, the clerk to swear in uh, the members of the panel, I want to just let everybody know how satisfied I am with the department, uh, with the uh, uh, hiring that they've done, and uh, just the remarkable progress that they've made in, in terms of outreach. Uh, many of the stakeholders here remember the days of MOVA very well. Uh, they were not always good days, although they were very good people with very good intentions that did the best that they could. Uh, the lack of uh, personnel and resources really held them back, and I have to say that the, uh, the Department of Veterans Service is just doing an incredible, incredible job reaching out to veterans in all five boroughs, and my office regularly receives compliments and phone calls about staffers who have helped them, uh, some of whom are veterans themselves, 
and how much they deeply appreciated the assistance that they got from DVS. So I know it's not perfect, and I'm sure there are lots of recommendations that people have, but I just want to let everybody know that I think that they're doing a great job, and, uh, and Dr. Sutton is doing a phenomenal job as the commissioner. I'm glad that Mayor de Blasio appointed her to be the first commissioner. She's making history uh, in New York City. She's the first commissioner of the Department of Veteran Services, and we're very glad and appreciative to have her here with us today. Thank you. To raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Ulrich and Council Member Vallone. My name is Lori Sutton. I, as you said, I am honored to serve as the first commissioner of the New York City Department of Veteran Services. I am joined today by our DVS uh, General Counsel and Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, Eric Henry, as well as uh, I think we've got about eight of uh, our members of Team DVS who, who are here today. We're also joined by other members of the administration. We've got Zoe Chenitz here from the City Commission on Human Rights, as well as Sheila Feinberg from the Department of Finance, in case the questions uh, uh, delve into fine details in those areas. But thank you so much for this opportunity to meet and to discuss the tremendous strides that the City of New York has made to serve veterans and their families since the bold creation of DVS with the enactment of Local Law 113 in 2016. As you know, prior to 2016, New York City's veterans were served by the Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs, MOVA, which was established in 1987 by Mayor Edward I. Koch, himself a veteran. The change from mayor's office to an independent department came about as a result of extensive advocacy efforts by the New York City veteran advocate community, legislative action led from this committee and supported throughout the city council through the passage of introductions 314 of 2014 and subsequent executive action by the signing of local law 113 by Mayor de Blasio. MOVA's historic mission to pr improve the lives of New York City veterans and their families has been exponentially expanded through the establishment of DVS with its unprecedented efforts to improve and strengthen veteran services and resources in New York City. Designing, staffing, and leading a startup agency within city government is an enormous privilege which Team DVS takes seriously to ensure that our efforts deserve the confidence and trust placed in us by so many. As the first new agency in the city of New York in over 15 years, DVS has worked diligently to not only build programmatic functions rooted in the value of service to others, but also the necessary internal infrastructure necessary to sustain a citywide agency for generations to follow. DVS was stood up in early 2016 with initial funding for 35 full-time staff. By the end of the calendar year 2016, DVS headcount had, had reached 27 full-time staff. The agency is currently at a headcount of 32 full-time staff. For FY18, DVS was approved for additional headcount, increasing capacity to 40 full-time staff, which DVS is protected, projected to reach in early 2018. In ramping up DVS's three programmatic divisions, or lines of action, the agency has worked to onboard a talented and diverse group of professionals to match resources with veteran needs. Veterans consistently tell our agency that navigating services is one of the biggest challenges in accessing services. So at DVS, we strive to take the frustrations, hassles, and trial and error out of navigation. From outreach and employment assistance to facilitating peer mentoring and whole health services to Veteran homelessness reduction, DVS staff members work with veterans one-on-one -on -one to help them figure out what benefits they might be eligible for and how to get access to services. Our direct programmatic outreach to veterans throughout our lines of action is as follows. Starting with whole health and community resilience. The whole health and community resilience team at DVS matches veterans and their families with opportunities to connect, to heal, to grow, and to thrive. As part of the pioneering Thrive NYC mental health initiative led by the First Lady, Sherlane McRae, this year the D DVS Thrive NYC team successfully implemented the Vets Thrive NYC Whole Health and Community Resilience Program, which is comprised of two parts. 
First, the whole health and community resilience outreach team, and secondly, the core four whole health model. The goal of Vets Thrive NYC is to engage 2,000 veterans and their families each year, improving their lives by enhancing access to a comprehensive range of services specifically tailored to the needs and strengths of veterans and their families. Vets Thrive NYC focuses on a coordinated integration of clinical and holistic services, including the identification of mental health symptoms as well as overall mental wellness aimed at addressing the full impact of war and military service on the mind, body, and spirit. DVS's core four whole health model shifts the conversation to concentrate on what matters most to veterans and their families regarding the many areas of life that can affect their health and well-being. It is designed to foster hope, healing, and wholeness through informed access to clinical treatment, community holistic services, peer and family and community social support, and cultural initiatives and the arts. The whole health and community resilience veteran outreach team has exceeded its goal by engaging a total of 7,176 New York City veterans and their families and constituents through various initiatives to increase social engagement and help seeking behaviors in the context of a peer-based support model. Grounded in the six guiding principles of the Thrive NYC Mental Health Initiative, the Whole Health and Community Resilience Team's multi-pronged outreach approach and core four whole health model programs are designed to engage the full scope of our veterans and their family members' lives. First, changing the culture. Whole health and community resilience focuses on changing the culture by encouraging individuals to have an open conversation about mental health. Mental health first aid training focuses on increasing awareness of mental health concerns and connections to services through education. DBS has successfully certified six members of the whole health and community resilience team as mental health first aid instructors and has trained 117 members of the New York City com community in this model and completed training to 22 New York City agency veteran liaisons as well as 95% of the DVS internal staff has now been trained in the veteran and military family mental health first aid training. Throughout the remainder of this year, DVS has several upcoming trainings scheduled with community partners, faculty, and administrators at New York City colleges and universities and the veterans community at large. Next, close treatment gaps. This year, DVS completed the integration of the NYC 311 information systems and the VA crisis hotline, which ensures that veterans and their families act early to address mental health challenges and that families are aware of and connected to available resources and mental health services. In conjunction with New York City 311, DVS ensured the connection of 141 veterans to mental health services at the VA crisis hotline and connected 380 individuals to mental health resources through NYC Well and an array of comprehensive mental and physical health service providers. Next principle is partner with communities. Engagement in cultural experiences and the arts represents a timeless connection to our shared humanity, acting as a healing balm to ease the human suffering of mind, body, and spirit. Through the core four whole health model outreach, the whole health and community resilience team ensures that veterans and their families are connected to creative writing programs, community art workshops, musical and theater groups, storytelling experiences, and other art-based and cultural events to help facilitate the healing process and launch their human journey towards wholeness. DVS's Theater of War project, led by public artist in residence Brian Dorries, is a two-year collaborative project with the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the Brooklyn Public Library. This year, the project has completed 16 performances and engaged 2,233 people through stage readings of ancient Greek plays that serve as a catalyst for town hall discussions about the challenges faced by service members, veterans, their caregivers, and families. Thus far, there are ad an additional nine performances scheduled between now and the remainder of the year. Brian Dorries is now partnering with multiple city agencies, including the Department of Probation, the District Attorney's Office, the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence, New York City Housing Authority, and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, to name a few. DVS and Brian Dorries continue to reach out to arts and community organizations in the spirit of collaboration. For instance, in the spring of 2017, DVS hosted a Veterans Artist Roundtable discussion with representatives from the Exit 12 Dance Company, Arts and the Armed Forces, Society of Artistic Veterans, Warrior Writers, 
Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, Poetic Theater Productions, and Bedlam. Our DVS lead for PAIR, Monique Rada, is constantly reaching out to interested organizations and individuals to explore collaboration potential. And we welcome any suggestions for community organizations, veteran service organizations, or other agencies who would be interested in working with us. There are more than 5.5 military and veteran caregiv caregivers in the United States. As a member of the Senator Elizabeth Dole Foundation's Hidden Heroes Initiative, the whole health and community resilience team has ensured that our New York City military and veteran caregivers are aware of and connected to comprehensive mental health services tailored to their needs. This year, DVS successfully hosted an event and engaged over 60 military and veteran caregivers to ensure that those serving in the shadows receive the assistance they deserve and have earned. Because of the tremendous work of the whole health team, we are proud to announce that just last week, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation has announced that New York City is leading the way as a model hidden heroes city. Next principle, act early. Through the whole health team's public facing outreach efforts, community forums, and speaking engagements, we have engaged with 4,651 individuals thus far this year. The whole health team conducts weekly multi-pronged outreach in satellite offices, at VA vet centers, New York City borough president offices, student veterans at colleges and universities, and other community and face-based organizations specific to veterans across the city. This direct interaction with veterans and their communities has increased our visibility and enhanced our ability to help individuals act early by providing veterans and their families with equal access to care that works for them when and where they need it. Next principle is use data better. Through a collaboration with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, otherwise known as SAMHSA, the whole health team hosted a virtual implementation academy on advancing suicide prevention best practices in peer support for service members, veterans, and their families. During this conference, DVS convened 25 mental health service providers in a conversation on peer-based suicide prevention efforts and methods to enhance collaboration and the use of data and technical assistance from SAMHSA in New York City. As a part of this process, SAMHSA's Technical Assistance Center is committed to helping New York City track our outcomes related to the vital role that peers can play in suicide prevention efforts. I'd like to say that uh, today we're joined by Darlene Brown-Williams. Dr. Williams is our uh, Assistant Commissioner for the Whole Health and Community Resilience Team. Please raise your hand, Darlene. Glad to have you here, and thank you for the work of you and your team. Next, we're moving on to uh, our second line of action, housing and support services, and uh, Commissioner, Assistant Commissioner and Senior Advisor Nicole Branca is here today as well. I'd just like to say, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, just, just for the record, you mentioned that we had uh, uh, attained functional zero. We are working towards, mightily towards, reaching functional zero. We have achieved ending, effectively ending chronic veteran homelessness in New York City, but we are well on the way towards functional zero. So thank you for allowing me to just clarify that. The department has been dedicated to effectively ending veteran homelessness in New York City. DVS's team of veteran peer coordinators continue to provide housing support to homeless veterans across the city. With only four veteran peer coordinators currently on board, our innovative peer-to-peer -peer housing only and housing first approach to providing assistance continues to culminate in an average of 200 to 250 placements into permanent housing each year. One of the more recent additions to this model was the inclusion of aftercare. Thanks to the initial support from Deutsche Bank, DVS was able to hire an aftercare coordinator in 2016. This coordinator's immediate success in preventing evictions and providing overall housing stability to formerly homeless veterans led to the mayor, city council, and the advocacy community supporting DVS's request to baseline this position. Thanks to the support, our extraordinary aftercare worker has continued to provide a safety net for veterans as many struggle with the reality of living independently again after living so long amongst their peers, first in war, then in shelter. Year to date, DVS's aftercare coordinator has provided assistance to 182 veterans and prevented imminent eviction 
for 17 veterans. Due to this successful track record, city funding for this position is included in the FY18 budget. In recognition of the strength of these interagency partnerships and New York's overall success in housing homeless veterans, earlier this year, New York City was chosen as the first city in the country to pilot the use of veteran Section 8 vouchers for veterans that have heretofore been ineligible for the program due to their discharge status. Together with NYCHA, the VA, and the Department of Homele Homeless Services, DVS is providing permanent affordable housing and services to 147 veterans thus far this year with other than dishonorable discharge status. DVS also continues to chair or participate in multiple committees and working groups to reduce the current homeless veteran census and identify new housing opportunities. The Housing and Support Services team also continues to provide extensive guidance and referrals to veterans and military families seeking assistance with a variety of housing and social services in the city. And secondly, to work with our government partners on policies and programs that can open more doors to New York City veterans. Additionally, DVS is proud of its partnership with the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development this past year, yielding support for student veterans with respect to the legal requirement for landlords to accept the basic allowance for housing integrated in the GI Bill as a source of income rent for student veterans. This letter is accessible, downloadable on the DVS website and may be used by student veterans uh, it, if and when a landlord rejects their uh, basic allowance for housing as income. Moving to the next line of action, CE5, which is City em Employment, Education, Entrepreneurship, Events, and Engagement. Pleased to have with us here Jamal Othman, who is the Assistant Commissioner for this line of action. This year, DVS established under this line of action, a citywide presence with satellite sites in each of the five boroughs. Community outreach specialists are trained to connect veterans and their families to trusted resources available to them from the city, state, federal governments. In this way, DVS has engaged and participated in over 300 community outreach events and provided one-on-one -on -one assistance to over 2,300 veterans and family members between March 2016 and May 2017 helping to navigate and apply for benefits such as the GI Bill, New York State tuition, veterans property tax exemption, and local housing support. In addition, DVS is committed to recruiting and connecting veterans and their families to city careers, services, and resources by upgrading the DVS website for direct access to city job opportunities, collaborating with DCAS citywide recruitment and Workforce One, as well as the public and private sectors to identify human resources best practices and developing public-private partnerships aimed at enhancing business, educational, and employment opportunities. DVS continues to administer the provisions of Local Law 42 of 2013 by providing training to city agency veteran liaisons. This year, DVS provided annual training on veteran mental health first aid training, which helps liaisons identify individuals who may be experiencing mental health challenges and assist in connecting them with service providers. Further, DVS enjoys a strong working relationship with the city's Veterans Advisory Board. I noticed that uh, we're joined today by Chair Todd Haskins and Secretary Joe Bello. Uh, appointed by Mayor de Blasio and Speaker Mark Viverito, the VAB was strategically selected to sustain a diverse range of service backgrounds, community engagement interests, and professional expertise to help facilitate dialogue and action with the New York City veterans community. In calendar year 2017, DVS worked with the VAB to provide four public meetings, and a fifth public meeting will be scheduled in November in Brooklyn. The public meetings are a valuable opportunity to inform the veterans community on the work being performed by the city and gives us a lens into the specific challenges faced by veterans and their families in each borough. We are very, very grateful for the efforts and the ongoing diligence of the, the VAB. Moving on to press engagement. DVS has utilized multiple platforms to engage with not only the veterans community but with the overall New York City population. Since September of 2016, DVS 
has expanded its outreach to constituents in a variety of ways, including speaking events, generating content, securing media coverage, engaging social media audiences, and reaching diverse audiences through print materials. Intergovernmental and external affairs, uh, right here, Eric Henry, our director of IGA and general counsel, is, affected, is focused on effective governmental state, let me try that again. DVS's Intergovernmental and External Affairs is focused on effective governmental stakeholder relationship and management and advocacy strategies aimed at meeting the needs of veterans and their families in a number of key areas. For example, the department is actively building upon the pioneering work led by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and its task force on behavioral health in the criminal justice system. And we are working with our partners in the VA, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, New York City Department of Correction, and legal services organizations on next steps. Over the past few months, as a city, we have seen the passage of Local Law 119 of 2017 which adds military status as a protected class under the New York City Human Rights Law, and Local Law 120 of 2017, which expands the alternative tax exemption for veterans. DBS looks forward to working with the Department, with the New York City Commission of Human Rights and the New York City Department of Finance to connect veterans with their rights under these new and exciting laws. DVS also looks to build upon Local Law 23 of 2015 by evaluating methods to standardize key stakeholder citywide intake forms to foster self-identification of veterans and families. In addition, DVS is in the process of integrating legal and compliance functionality with external affairs as we continue to grow into a full sustainable agency. I might just add that under intergovernmental and external affairs, uh, the community, the veterans advocate community has been very much involved. This committee, the city council, we are very appreciative, the public advocate. Uh, it takes a team and we are very fortunate to uh, work with this team here in New York, New York City. Public and private partnerships, DVS is committed to seeking out new avenues for collaboration and cross-sector initiatives to leverage the strengths and support the needs of New York City's veterans and their families. To this end, public and private partnerships is actively engaged in scouting, evaluating, and securing local and national partnerships aimed at veteran-specific needs and outcomes. I'd like to just point out that we've got uh, Cassandra Alvarez. Please raise your hand, Cass, uh, who is our uh, new, fairly recent uh, appointee to this position. Uh, very, very important position for us at DVS. Some current projects include launching a mentoring initiative which brings together 25 different service providers in an effort to collectively identify and address the peer-to-peer -peer needs of veterans and their families. Secondly, launching the Veterans on Campus initiative, a consortium of post-secondary institutions, veteran service organizations, advocates, and civic leaders who aim to position and promote the unique value of a New York City-based post-secondary education for veterans and their families. Public and private partnerships is also actively exploring new alliances that will increase agency capacity and connect private and public dollars to projects that will drive productive outcomes for veterans and their families. Moving on to information, technology, and data. Last year, the Department of Veteran Services connected its, conducted its first accounting of the veteran population in New York City. Using American Community Survey and Vet Pop 2014 data, extrapolations from New York State National Guard and Reserve strengths and estimates of non-federally qualified veterans, the department delivered the first accurate veterans population estimates as well as demographic and geographic information that is available on its website. In addition, DVS installed its own IT network this year, assuring compliance with industry standards and best practices. DVS took advantage of having no legacy systems and deployed a lean mobile technology asset set supporting increased data collection, internal information sharing, and maximum freedom for field staff to conduct outreach while maintaining office capabilities. The department is proud to be 100% mobile and 100% capable in six locations across the five boroughs after just one year. 
Currently, DVS is in the implementation phase of projects to deliver a department-wide customer relationship management solution as well as an interactive voice response system to speed phone engagement. Procurement of Vet Connect NYC, an innovative online platform that will connect veterans and their families with a constellation of vetted service providers across a variety of coverage areas, has moved past public hearing and drafting and is now in active negotiation. Implementation is anticipated over the next six months. In conclusion, DVS looks forward to a robust future dedicated to improving the lives of New York City veterans and their families. Core to our mission is the belief that veterans and their families are our city's leading natural renewable resource. And their strength and demonstrated commitment to public service will help New York City thrive. As the department continues to grow in vision, scope, and cap capacity, we will build the strongest foundation possible for connecting veterans and their families with high-quality services across a variety of needs. All of this is driven towards empowering our veterans' capacity for and commitment to continued service within our city as great neighbors, community volunteers, civic leaders, employees, business owners, and families. It is important to note that we do not and cannot work in a vacuum. The list is too long to list fully today, but we would like to take a moment to thank our colleagues at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, Law Department, Department of Cultural Affairs, City Commission on Human Rights, Department of Social Services, Department of Housing Preservation and Development, New York City Housing Authority, Department of Homeless Services, Department of Small Business Services, Veterans Affairs, Department of Finance, Vets Thrive NYC Consortium and Core 4 Whole Health Steering Group, Veterans Advisory Board, nonprofit and private sector partners, our veterans services and advocacy community, and the countless service providers we work with for continuing to support our veterans. Finally, we would like to thank you, Chair Ulrich, members of the Committee on Veterans for your stalwart support, past and present, in pushing the veterans' agenda forward here in New York City. I would agree with you, Chair Ulrich. We are making history. There's a lot that we've done, a lot more to do, but thank you again for this opportunity to meet with you today. I look forward now to addressing your questions and ideas. Well, Commissioner, thank you so much for your excellent uh, testimony. Uh, before I uh, continue, I just want to recognize that we've been joined by Council Members Cabrera of the Bronx, uh, Joe Borelli, Staten Island, and Valone uh, from Queens for the uh, attendance sheet, for sure. Terrific. You know, as I'm sitting here, I'm listening to your testimony, I'm reading, I'm following along, and I recall that almost four, prior to you uh, entering city service, four years ago, um, in late September, was our first hearing that I first chaired as the chair of this committee, and we were in a little room across the street, and there were five people other than myself, and uh, uh, matter of fact, uh, Joe Bello, Kristen, Rob, Ed Daniels, and uh, there was one other person. I don't recall off the top of my head who was. I think I think it was uh, my friend from the Brennan Center. Yeah, there were five people, and I and I said, "Are you sure this is the right hearing? Are you sure this is the right room?" But I knew there was a problem. I knew that there was at that time a historic lack of attention and lack of funding. Uh, that the city had paid to the veterans community for years and throughout administrations. It was uh, structurally flawed and uh, it needed a lot of work. And uh, here we are, fast forward four years later, we're in a much nicer room. Uh, we have a real agency, a dedicated city agency that is doing phenomenal work serving veterans and their families. We have a functioning, and I, I use the word functioning because it's very important, VAB, the Veterans Advisory Board that is uh, chaired by Todd and, and uh, some of the other members are here as well. And they're doing some really interesting work and they're helping us with the outreach. At one time, the VAB report was simply a, a compilation of their minutes that they just filed with the city. Now we're actually getting concrete recommendations and uh, um, suggestions legislatively, policy-wise. I just think that we owe it to all those who fought so hard for, for so long for the veterans in this city to really 
give them the credit. And I think of people like Paul Narson, and, uh, who's no longer with us. He's with the Lord now. And John Rowan, who has been so active for so many years, and so many others who've been fighting for years uh, just to get veterans on the radar. And now not only on, are they on the radar, but they're really just they are just doing terrific things. So it's, it's very rewarding for me to hear and receive your testimony today. And I, and I just want to reiterate um, how appreciative I am to work so closely with you and what a great job you and your staff are doing in so many different areas, mental health, homelessness, housing. I met a veteran. He came to my office a couple of months ago. His, for privacy reasons, his, he shall remain nameless. But he received one of the vouchers. And he was living in a shelter for 11 years. And now he's living a couple blocks from my district office, and we're working very closely with him to help him really get on his feet and get the things that, um, that he needs to rebuild his life. But he, how appreciative he is to be able to live independently with dignity. And that really meant something for this fellow to find his way into my office and, and um, to seek us out and to let us know that he was getting the help that he needed and that he he felt like he was able to put his life back together again. So, you know, we talk about numbers and staffers and things in the budget, and that's all very important and that's all well and good. But if one person were able to save a life or change a life for the better, then all of this is worth it. Every hearing, every dollar, every decision that we make is, um, is really worth it. You know, we're going to be, deb not debating, but we're going to be discussing some very, uh, you know, in the weeds issues. But four years ago, these questions would have never been asked. There was, just, there was just no way any of these things would even be possible. So I just want to sort of reiterate that and put that in your minds as we go through it. Uh, great work the department is doing on public-private partnerships. I think we need to do more of it, and I know that uh, the city is certainly open to that. Um, I want to talk about the city agencies and the liaisons, the veteran liaisons, because I know that uh, you have done a great job training a lot of those people. I'm wondering if you can uh, talk about uh, some of your interactions with the uh, uh, City Department of uh, uh, Health and Human Services, uh, HHC, uh, I'm sorry, Health and Hospitals Corporation. Um, you know, a lot of times if a veteran is um, sent to a hospital for whatever reason, they don't go to the VA. They may, they may go to a city hospital. And what type of interaction they're having when they're in the emergency room if a person is, uh, if they have uh, mental health issues or if they're having physical health issues, you know, uh, what training or, or what interactions are we having with the folks at HHC uh, to make sure that they're sensitive to veterans' health care needs and, and the type of care that they may be eligible for? So that's an important question, and it's one which uh, we know uh, deserves some attention during this coming year. We have not yet held specific HHC training, but we're aware that there are times, for example, recently it came to my attention that uh, a veteran was uh, uh, actively suicidal and really in crisis, and there was a need to obtain uh, information from that veteran's uh, uh, VA medical health records, and so it highlighted a need for us to really dig into this area and determine uh, what kinds of relationships, what kinds of procedures, what kinds of communication needs to be in place to really protect uh, the needs of our veterans who may be uh, hospitalized or otherwise receiving critical care. I know there's a, the First Lady um, has done a tremendous job with the Vets Thrive initiative working closely with you and uh, her efforts to deal with the mental health issues in the city, which really are uh, systemic, um, and maybe this could be a part of it. So that's an area, I think, where HHC could perhaps uh, work more closely with you to develop some sort of training or guidelines or things that doctors and nurses in the emergency rooms can keep an eye out for. You know, people don't walk around with a sign that says, I'm a veteran, mm -hmm. necessarily. But certainly in the intake process, we might be able to find some of these things out and then direct them to specialized care that, that, the, that HHC doesn't provide currently. We know that they can't do everything, right? So we want to make sure that they uh, work more closely with you. I would just add to that that uh, NYC Well, which was recently stood up earlier this year as part of the First Ladies Thrive NYC initiative, uh, they have veteran-specific resources that are outlined, and so that's been a, a sort of an adjunct uh, 
to our existing outreach work as well as the 311 uh, platform, but it's been very effective because you can, anyone can call 1-888-NYC-WELL uh, and access a trained mental health counselor who can then sort your situation out with you and then customize a, a way forward in terms of connecting you to services. I think also in addition to the administration at HHC, maybe um, dealing with doctor's counsel in 1199, the union that represents the city's doctor and uh, nurse workforce, uh, they I'm sure would be very supportive and helpful. I know that they have weekly, uh, by annual seminars and meetings and things, and that may be an opportunity for you to reach more uh, folks and maybe you know make yourself or your team available to have a quick uh, presentation to them to let them know what you're there to provide in terms of in-kind help and other things. I just think there's well, there's so many resources that the, the challenge for someone like you is to try to put everything under one umbrella and network people and connect people to different spots. Wouldn't well, you, you know, agree? That really is one of the uh, very welcome challenges and we know that certainly now that we've put so much effort in building the foundation, bringing on certainly the bulk of our uh, staffing, we've got more to go, but we know that communication is vitally important. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's something we welcome your continued ideas and enthusiasm for how we could most effectively do that. On, on the subject of the, the uh, veteran liaisons, are there any city agencies that do not have a veteran liaison or currently without one, that, to your knowledge? Or uh, check with and which agencies might th those be if there are? Just Councilmember, we do have a handful that do not. That's because of uh, attrition that happens naturally at agencies. So what we do is we work with them to identify new liaisons. So we have a handful. I can get you that list. Okay. Uh, but typically, um, those positions will be fi filled. And when they're filled, other agencies will also have attrition. And naturally, of course. there's this yeah. ongoing. Um, so we could provide that list. I, I think yeah. maybe it would be helpful if, uh, if, it w if those names were... Um, well, the way to contact those people was somehow made publicly available, either on the agency's website or on your website, or just a, just a suggestion. I don't know if that's yeah. um, if so that's even possible. But it, it's actually on the DVS website. Oh, great! And and I will tell you that we have not, you know, had any difficulty, uh, you know. Uh, working with agencies in this regard, but there is the process of natural attrition and turnover from time to time. But on the on the agency website, we do provide that information. The city's workforce is uh, filled with uh, um, former service members that work in almost every role: cops, firemen, teachers, and and the municipal workers that uh, are still serving. Right? They're still serving, and Absolutely. they. They don't make a ton of money, but they're doing it because they love to help people and they love to serve. And, you know, we, the administration and, and uh, policymakers, we have to do everything we can to help them get access to things that they need. Um, also, uh, with respect to the liaisons, uh, the agency liaisons, I should say, and with respect to Human Rights Commission, um, has there been any outreach? using those liaisons to let them know about the recent changes to the law that protects uh, people in housing and accommodation, and public accommodation in other areas. How are we spreading the word that that law was passed and that that is, in fact, a protected class among the agencies? Right. Well, there was certainly, there have been a couple of press events, and we're now working also with the City Commission on Human Rights for an event in November, and we'll then really launch a full communication uh, <coughs> outreach effort in that regard to get the word out because it's not enough to do the good work and many of the folks in this room have worked towards that end and now we need to get the the information out For but sure. i was talking with a veteran as early as you know this morning about this change in the law we're getting the word out one-on-one -on -one, but we're also uh, putting it on our website as well as doing it uh, a series of public facing events the next one of which is planned for november that's great. Uh, lastly, and then I know my colleagues have some questions um, regarding the mayor's management report. In, in year one of the agency, um, we uh, were very liberal in terms of compliance with different things that other agencies have to uh, 
uh, do by law, and one of them was the MMR, sure. the Mayor's Management Report. It, it would be impossible to measure certain things if they were still getting up and running. But now that year one is under our belt, can we expect to see the Department of Veterans Services in the Mayor's Management Report uh, next Absolutely. fiscal year? We've been working this. We're well aware of this requirement. We've been working with the Mayor's Office of Operations over this last year. We plan to submit our MMR metrics in February, and then we'll roll into FY19 as a full contributor, as, a, as an agency to that process. Again, I just want to reiterate, four years ago, we would not be having these conversations. <laughs> you know, is it going to be in the MMR? Are you going to have 37 or 40 employees? I think there were four employees yeah. counting the commissioner four years ago. So uh, the fact that we're even into these issues is quite remarkable. And I have to tip my hat again to you, Commissioner, because the mayor needed a general to set this up and get the organizational <laughs> chart and uh, he found the perfect person for the job because you have got this thing up and running in lightning time. I think what, what might have taken years to set up otherwise you've been able to do in one year. And I, I tip my hat to you, to your, um, your capability, your dedication, your enthusiasm, your intelligence. I really think that the veterans of New York City are, are in much better shape today because of your leadership. Uh, than they were four years ago and 40 years ago, quite frankly. So you're doing a great job, and I want to, again, tip my hat to you and Well, and back that. at you, Mr. Chair, you know, we are blessed. We're blessed to live in the world's greatest city. We've got a fantastic uh, team of supporters, both with this committee, the entire city council, this convergence of leadership over the last three years, the mayor, the entire administration, and yes, the best veterans advocates in the world. And without that entire team effort, we would not be in this position. And uh, so thank you for your kind words on behalf of my team, my staff, as well as the veterans and their families here in New York City. Uh, we will continue this journey. It's a, it's a moment in history that will not come our way again. We've got to make it yeah, count. We, we put we, me and you and the mayor and the, and. Councilmember Vallone and 47 other sponsors, we put MOVA on the ash heap of history and we replaced it with something real and something that works and we will never go back. We will only go forward and make things better. I'm going to refer it, uh, turn the hearing over to Councilmember Vallone and then Councilmember Cabreras for some questions. I'm going to step out for just five minutes and then I'll be back. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you, Chair Ulrich. And I have to agree, Commissioner General, Doctor, and so many of the titles that when now we're all reflecting on our past four years, the co-sponsoring the creation of DVS was probably the best thing that I've been able to do in my four years. And now when we're all out in our communities, that's the first thing I tell them. So I, I join in our chair in the, uh, the well-earned praise. It was not easy. And I look at our advocates out in the audience and I see Joe smiling and everyone else. Um, yeah, there's been 44 years of balloons in the council and this was the first time. So I have a little bragging rights when I go home at the dinner table and I see the two other balloons. I'm like, hey, you guys didn't do this. We did this, we did this. <laughs> so it's something we have. But I think the interagency, no matter what committee we're on, always turns to be, for me, one of those battles, hopefully in the next four years that we can assist you with and the other agencies because there's so much good work going on, but especially with veterans since we're the new man on the block with this, with this agency as to making sure that our issues are heard within the other agencies. So in one of the sections that you brought up and you mentioned with Elizabeth Dole um, and the hidden heroes, I sit on aging, I chair senior centers, caregivers, caregiver support is such an unheralded, yes. almost forgotten generation that is taking care of those above and below. Um, and I think there's an opportunity that we have here to to really focus on veteran caregivers in the 21st century in 2017 and what it means to be in that role. Um, maybe just an opportunity for you to speak a little bit on maybe what some of your vision may be here for future uh, initiatives, policy, or funding that we can really coordinate now with DIFTA, with our other sister agencies to say this is a across the board problem, but now specifically with veterans, we want to focus on maybe some of your thoughts. Councilmember Vallone, thank you so much for your comments and for raising this important issue because, as you said, so often caregivers are just overlooked. That's why Senator Dole named this campaign the Hidden Heroes Campaign. 
We know that the, the stresses, for example, uh, of working as a full-time caregiver are, are enormous in their impact on the immune system, health and well-being, the ability to function. We know that social support often gets, uh, you know, uh, left behind and the isolation and impact of this kind of uh, work can be profound. So when we were uh, contacted earlier this year by the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, this this campaign just spoke to our hearts because so many of us know not just veterans and military caregivers, but members of our own uh, families or the broader com community here in New York City. And I think that this is going to be one of those issues which, like ending veteran homelessness, I think in working with veterans and their families, we can take the most vexing challenges of our city and by determining what are the needs and what can be done better to support veterans and their, in this case, caregivers, we can then share those lessons, those insights, those policies, those programs to benefit the larger community. And so to this point in this endeavor, I've talked to Commissioner uh, Corrado in brief about this. She knows that we're launching on this journey. We're just at the very beginning. So any ideas that you have, and I would love to sit with you and members of your committee and to brainstorm this. What we've done to date, which is what I mentioned in the testimony, is we've reached out here in the New York City uh, community area. We had an initial event, the Intrepid, which uh, uh, you know, showed a movie that illustrated some of the challenges of uh, in this case, veteran uh, caregivers, and then followed that with a panel. And it was a panel that was, was moderated by uh, one of the folks with, one of the leaders within the Blue Star uh, Military Family Association, which just this year established a New York City office, but other members of the community as well. We have an individual on our team who herself has the experience of having been a military uh, caregiver, and so we are, we are excited about this. It's 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 an area whose needs and opportunities are as vast as virtually any other that I think we could we could take on. In part because it's been so neglected. I would just say also in closing on this issue, we'll keep you posted on progress, and would love to collaborate with you and your committee. Um, I, I, I feel very privileged that, that uh, uh, Dr. Linda Davis, who has uh, been named by Secretary Shulkin uh, to serve as the director of the My VA Experience, she has reached out to DVS and has asked me to join the new uh, advisory committee on military and veteran families, caregivers, and survivors. So this at the federal level will be another way in which we can link in to learn from what's going on more broadly, where we can contribute to what's going on at the federal level, and we can apply all of that locally with all of the vast resources that we have to improve things for New Yorkers and beyond. So I, I think you bring up an important, important topic, and I think it comes up um, time and time again, notification to DVS when there is a case opened up, or again, we use DIFTA as, a, as an example because I, I often, <laughs> with Commissioner Corrado and others, are trying to assist in, in getting them the information they need in dealing with the seniors. It's the same thing with veterans. Is DVS notified when another agency is dealing with a veteran? Just right off the top. So this, and I know that uh, this is something we've talked about over the last couple of years. It's something we're working towards. We're working right now with the Mayor's Office of Operations to include uh, questions that, that will allow veterans to self-identify and veteran family members to self-identify. We fought for the ID card just for that purpose. But, Correct. But does your agency get, uh, what I'm trying to do is centralize. It's worked so well in other agencies and, and right. that we have a file kept for anyone that seeks a city service that now the city right. maintains so we don't have to reinvent the wheel every week when someone else calls up. So if, if, if housing is working for a housing issue with a veteran, does DVS get notification that that's happening or is that separate kept in their department? 
We currently do not get that notification, but the first step towards getting that notification is to develop the mechanism by which a veteran or veteran family member uh, self-identifies when seeking services with the city. So we know that that's the first step, that's the foundational step. But we're aimed at True, that there may be some issue. cases they don't even know they're dealing with a veteran. So e that, e that, exactly, that may be the exactly. Case. So we are well aware of uh, the distance we have to travel on that road, but we are absolutely working towards that greater end. I think that's where we have some great work to be done, and that's where the caregiver aspect, because a lot of time it's the loved one making the phone call on behalf of a veteran, especially if it's an elderly um, veteran. But I, I think that needs to be done. I think every agency needs to be notified where a veteran or someone, uh, what, whatever committee we're talking to, should be notified that a veteran's case almost like a case management system is what I'd like to start um, within veterans so that there can be a universal file maintained with DVS with every veteran that we have in the city. Hopefully they never need city services, but the, the way the, uh, we're going, that's not going to be the case. So would that be something maybe we could, we could work on? And then again, obviously funding that because we want to be able to get you additional staff um, to follow and maintain that information because it's nice to say it, but you have to have the staff to do it. So, Sure. No, I, I would absolutely be delighted to work with you towards that greater end. We know that the, the greater clarity that we have on, on, on identifying veterans, both those who are struggling as well as those who are really thriving, uh, uh, it's important for us to know as much as we can about our veteran community to include veterans' families. I want to always make that point, uh, which in many cases also does include the caregivers. Even with Department of Finance, how many times we, we are told as council members that someone's not aware of a tax benefit that mm -hmm. they're entitled to, finance is not going to freely give that information out because mm -hmm. they need to have the extra income. And here we have a veteran's tax exemption, which our homeowners are entitled to, and now we have an additional expansion of that. Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to champion with the Department of Finance that information to get to our veterans so they know they're entitled to that because so Absolutely. many times they're not. And, and I, I just want to applaud the Department of Finance. We've been working with them and they've created this one pager which will uh, uh, be, it's already on their website, it'll be linked on our website and we'll be pushing it out to the veterans community. What's important to, to understand about this most recent exemption for the uh, school taxes is that if a veteran homeowner already is registered for the property tax exemption, there's no, no, no action needed. Department of Finance is automatically that's taking wonderful. that in. Now, what that's not often the case, so that's why I say thank you. Yeah. So, so it's a great example. Also with HPD, I think I mentioned my testimony, this uh, letter that we've made available on our website so that student veterans, when they run into a landlord who perhaps doesn't know that the housing allowance uh, legally must be accepted as proof of income, student veteran can just download that letter, work with the landlord, and if, if that still runs into interference, they can come back to us, and thanks to this recent law with the uh, uh, addition to the, the City Commission on Human Rights, uh, they can bring it to, the, to either us or to the uh, Human Rights Commission and get redress, yeah. which is really an exciting, I mean, that's, that's a, it's a lot of work that's gone on on behalf of veterans and their families that we've got to get the word out to the folks that it benefits. Perfect. Thank and the you. last question is in your informa information technology and data section, you gave us everything but the actual total number of the current veterans. Do you have that data? Because I know it was over 2 million, but I'm just curious to where we... 210,000. 210,000. Yeah. I said million, I meant thousand. That's with veterans, uh, the active duty, which is a very small number, as well as our National Guard and Reserve components here in New York City. Wonderful. Thank you, Commissioner. And now, Council Member Cabrera. Uh, thank you so much, uh, and Commissioner, thank you. I want to personally first thank you for sending a representative when we had the opportunity to honor uh, this August uh, a very brave young lady who made the ultimate sacrifice. She was the first uh, female soldier to be killed in, in Iraq. Uh, it was really a very moving day, and thank you for, uh, for making it even more special. Uh, I want to focus on a couple of uh, aspects here. One is, uh, and one I want to focus on is how can veterans better 
uh, strategy, better ways and strategies to uh, let veterans know about DVS. Uh, it's new. Uh, and I was wondering, have you ever done a Facebook campaign uh, and just tagging uh, the word veterans uh, to be able to reach uh, this segment of the population? Well, thank you so much, Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you for your comments as well as your uh, collaboration and teamwork. We know that in the area of communication, we've got miles to go. I will tell you, though, relative to where we were a year ago, now that you mentioned it, let me just give you a little idea of what we've done to this point, but we're Please. continuing to build. One point is that we have hired a, um, brought on a, a film fellow from the New York Film Academy. Uh, we had one film fellow for six months, I believe, and now we've just welcomed our second film fellow who's working with us to do video clips, which can be sent out on uh, Facebook as well as through Twitter. But in terms of speaking events, DVS Press, and I think we've got Alexis Wachowski here, actually. Uh, raise your hand, Alexis. Uh, speaking events, we've reached out uh, at my level, commissioner level, drafting content for 43 speaking events in all five boroughs, including 22 discussion-oriented events, 18 keynote speakers, and three mayoral events. Uh, in terms of securing media coverage, we've been featured in the news 38 times in the past year with 13 television interviews, two radio interviews, and 23 print articles, including four features in the New York Times. In terms of generating content, the DVS press office has issued 28 official agency communications, including 11 press statements, press releases, seven blog posts, and six documentary shorts, and four transcripts from public testimony. And then finally, in terms of engaging the social media audience through daily activity on social media, DVS Press increased its Twitter following to over 4,190 followers, a 26% increase from September of last year to now. And then we've also increased our Facebook following to 333,344 3, likes, up 16% in the last That's year. That's very good. So we've, we, we, We've, oh, there's one more. That's not all. Reaching diverse audiences through print materials. DBS Press has created print materials for the agency, both how New York City invests in New York in veterans, our brochure, as well as each line of action has a, a, uh, a flyer as well as programs for special events. Is it enough? No. So to this end, we invite all ideas as we tool up for this next year. We've got a deputy press secretary who's coming on board here in the next few weeks. We're excited about that. We work with City Hall Press Office. We will work with you. We work with the community, with organizations, and any ideas that you have. We're all ears because we're, you know, we, we over the last year, I'll, I'll be frank with you, it, it uh, Creating something out of nothing in a city uh, environment is a journey not for the faint of heart, but we've had the right team and the right support, and we are where we are today, and now we're ready to just really tell that story. And, and so thank you for bringing up this issue. I couldn't agree more. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's a great start. I, I, I think by any measure that was uh, you have uh, been able to get uh, uh, the message out. Uh, I was just wondering if you ever done a, like a pay campaign, uh, so through Facebook, uh, which by the way, 300,000 uh, likes uh, is, is very impressive. Uh, but it, you know, through Facebook, it's no, it's, it's, it's an amazing start. It really, it truly is. Uh, anybody who has 300,000 likes. Uh, oh no, it's 3,000. Oh, 3,000. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, 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 now, no. now now I can help you with this. Then. Okay, I thought it was 300,000. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. wow. Let me hire you for the next campaign. Uh, so, uh, one of the ways that you know many companies or nonprofits uh, get their message. Now is to is to actually pay um, through Facebook uh, and also through Instagram to get the message out. So it's it's not you 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 literally um, are able to expand your network of contacts uh, through Facebook and and a lot of veterans. It's been my experience uh, they are they feel safe in Facebook and uh, and then the 
the younger population of veterans, uh, they're, they tend to be attracted to Instagram. I think this will be a great way to get the message out, and not only them, but their families, friends. Uh, but you can start just with the veterans. I think that, w- that would be awesome. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing I was going to ask you is, because I'm very curious, I really don't know the answer to this question, is chaplains in the military are, are often v- very trusted member of, of the community, uh, military community. Uh, is, is there a way or is, is there a dynamic already in place with the mental health organizations to work with these uh, veteran chaplains to give of their time or even uh, get higher uh, uh, capacity? Because some of the issues uh, in in having work in both fields, my doctor is in counseling, I'm a licensed mental health counselor, I'm also a pastor of a church, and I also function as a chaplain. Uh, I can tell you there's some questions that the mental health feel cannot answer. They're really about meaning, significance of life, uh, and other existential issues, which a lot of soldiers experience. Uh, and I'm just wondering if there's, there's a way, uh, if, if that is happening already, where chaplains are recruited back again to, to, to work with, with veterans. You know, thank you for that question, uh, Councilmember Cabrera. I- let me just say at the onset, I'm a huge fan of chaplains. Uh, I love to hear it's that. It's just, uh, they are really combat multipliers in mm. the military and here in the community. Um, there's much more that we can do to engage not just our military chaplain population, although we do work with, with them on a regular basis, but also our larger uh, you know, faith community, Hmm. Uh, the houses of worship. We've uh, really been privileged to work with the First Ladies Thrive NYC program over the last two years with the Weekend of Faith uh, to be able to engage, I mean, thousands and thousands of New Yorkers to help change the culture about mental health and to let them know what's available and to make it seem like the normal thing to do if you have a broken leg you get it set you go to an orthopedic doctor if you've got you know problem with depression will you go and and you get mental health uh services and treatment that's community based and that is is appropriate culturally and in every other way for your needs uh assistant commissioner dr uh uh uh, Darlene Brown Williams, uh, she has then built upon the weekend of faith more recently in the last several weeks and has moved to provide the mental health first aid training. I think that's been in two uh, houses of worship thus far, but we're already getting a uh, request for more. So this is a this this is a burgeoning effort on our part when we say that we are committed to reaching veterans and their family members uh, you know to to address the 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 physical the mental the spiritual aspect of their service and of their ongoing journey towards wholeness wholeness we really mean that and we're just you know at the beginning phase of that journey but already it's paying off in ways that uh are really remarkable, and I appreciate the the question. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for your appreciation of, of the work that they do. I think uh, something that I may suggest that I've seen done in other fields is, you know, uh, pastors, priests, rabbis, imams, they, they, they're very extremely busy. Um, they do a lot with very little. Uh, if there is a package that is given to them, even a message outline, uh, a little video intro with testimonies, uh, being able to even do a 30 second commercial, uh, and also resources, uh, and maybe on, you know, on Veterans Day weekend and that weekend, uh, that, that information could be you know, disseminated to uh, people uh, of faith and 
uh, and even small groups, uh, how to have support groups, and which at the end of the day will cost the city nothing. I mean, because, you know, you, you have that, that volunteer base. So uh, it warms my heart to hear uh, your disposition uh, towards Chaplin. And with that, I want to thank you, Commissioner, for all you do and for your leadership. Looking forward to collaborating even more. And with that, I turn it back to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the extended thank time. You. <coughs> thank you. Council Member Cabrera giving. is the chaplain of the city council unofficially, so we want to thank him. Perfect. Uh, for, Just give me more work. Uh, that's right. <laughs> and no extra pay. But uh, <laughs> yes, you're doing God's work. The harvest is plenty and the laborers are few, right? So <clears throat> that's an unpaid. Uh, you know, can I just add one thing, uh, Councilmember Cabrera? We have a, uh, uh, an intern right now, Aquila, is just waiting for things to work out for her to uh, join the Air Force, and she's... Uh, just a whiz at social media and uh, communication. So maybe we can engage with you and uh, take you up on some of your I, ideas. I would love that, and I and I believe that I, I could connect you with some people that will be helpful and do it pro bono. You know, the mayor appointed uh, a council, a faith council, last year as yes. well, and we're looking forward to really fully engaging with that council. They've been so instrumental in working with the First Lady in the Thrive NYC program, and now that we're getting our sea legs and uh, really coming up on this second year of operations, we really look forward to, to the way ahead. Marvelous. So, thank thank you. you. The city has a very proud tradition of working with and partnering with faith-based initiatives to provide a host of public accommodations and uh, housing and Catholic charities, Met Council, so many other uh, faith-based uh, groups and initiatives. And uh, this is an area where I think they, they should also uh, work closely together with uh, the new department uh, to provide mental health treatment for uh, people of a religious persuasion that could be helped by it. So we're, we're very uh, encouraged by that. And also, uh, I think that's a great idea with the Facebook ads and the Twitter and everything else. We have to promote and sponsor and boost and do whatever we have to do to get the word out that there is help available for veterans and their families and that they're not alone. So a lot of them don't go to meetings. They don't go to certain groups or buildings or places. But, you know, they are on social media, so we have to reach them. And I want to uh, thank... Uh, um, uh, your staff for doing such a great job with Twitter in particular. I follow them, and they're always posting events and updates. I don't know who's in charge of that, but they're you're doing amazing a, team. You do, who's in charge of the Twitter handle? Let's what see, you where's doing? Aqu Aquila? Stand if up. That's if our, only uh, our, our social media intern who's well, getting ready to if join. Only, the if only we could get him to work at the White House, that things would be running as. <laughs> Things would be well, running as smoothly there, too. I don't know. And, and, you know, Mr. Chair, if I could just add, I think it's so important. Uh, you know, it says it's as important for us to develop out our social media st strategy, which connects with one cohort of veterans and their families. But we know there's no one-size-fits-all approach. So we still hand-deliver invitations, for example, to the mayor's breakfast at Veterans Day, because we've got veterans who they're not, you know, they're they're not going to get the word any other way. So we've got to have a whole range of outreach uh, and events and ways of communicating and meeting the needs and strengths of our veterans and families. So it's, uh, it's, it's fun to, uh, to engage with the entire community and then to customize our approach to fit a given individual and or family. I promise the administration I get you out of here by 2.30, and I have two minutes to spare. So the, <laughs> last, the last question, okay. the very last question, and I promise it, it shall be the last, is with respect to the contracting. I know that this is uh, still an ongoing conversation that we're having, but many of the nonprofits and the groups that the council funds and provides resources for, they're very frustrated historically that they have to go through several agencies that don't quite speak the same language. And we're really hoping that in year two or in the very near future that the administration plans on allowing DVS to be a full contracting agency and have a contracting officer. So is there any update on that issue? No, there's no update at this point. We are certainly uh, very pleased to, to have gotten the new needs that we requested for this last year up to a head count of 40. And of course, we're always looking to identify uh, what our emerging needs will be to sustain ourselves as an agency, and certainly that is one of the topics that is up for uh, exploration as well as analysis and eventual decision. The, uh, the council 
if it's not included in the, in the mayor's preliminary budget, may include it in the budget response, and it's just something that uh, we just want to be on the record saying that we'd like to see in the future, respectfully. So, Commissioner Sutton and uh, uh, Assistant Commissioner, thank you so much uh, for being here today and for your testimony. Thank you again. Much. Thank you. Okay, the next panel uh, will be comprised of Mr. Todd Haskins, our chair of the Veterans Advisory Board, Mr. Rob Pashoda, representing the Small Business Development Center um, for Brooklyn, uh, Kristen Rouse from the New York City Veterans Alliance, and Linda First. Oh, Lisa, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Oh, did R Rob leave? Uh, do you want to read his testimony or no? Okay. All right. Rob had to step out, so we'll, we'll skip over that. I'm sorry. Lisa first. I apologize. Um, representing MHA, NYC, VMHC. Oh, okay. Well, then we'll have one panel. Um, we'll also hear from Anthony Pike representing Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, IAVA. And uh, Joe, are you, you wanted to testify? Okay. You, well, you know what? Why don't we do this? Joe, come up. You're the secretary. You sit next to the chair. And uh, now I'm the general, now that Dr. Sutton sat down. So it's still, it's still my hearing. So you get to sit there. And then we'll wait for IAVA. We'll do IAVA on, an, on another panel with uh, Mr. Tawaki uh, Korematsu. So we'll, we'll do that after. Uh, why don't we begin with the VAB uh, chair, and uh, they don't have to be sworn in, right? No. Or sworn at, so that's a good thing. All right, so you begin when you're ready. Mr. Haskins, chairman. There we go. There we go. Uh, chairman Alder Ulrich, Councilmember Cabrera and Vallone, uh, as well as the other members of the committee, Commissioner Sutton and other attendees of today's hearing, uh, let me start by first thanking the committee. Uh, both for holding this hearing today and also for your continued focus and leadership on ensuring that veterans of New York City are taken care of, uh, inclusive of, and after the formal creation of the Department of Veteran Services, which, which you guys were a huge uh, instrumental part of the leadership of. Uh, you've changed the course of history for veterans in New York City, and you should be proud of your role in making that a reality. DVS is now just a little bit over a year old and has made amazing strides, but it still has a long way to go before it's a fully functioning agency and that's going to take time and resources. Uh, given that the last new agency was established nearly a quarter of a century ago, uh, there is no playbook, simply said, there's no playbook, so we're all learning this as we go. And so we appreciate all the feedback that you guys have provided and, and hopefully that uh, ourselves and certainly the advocacy community has provided. Um, let me provide just a little bit of background. I covered this in my testimony on the VAB oversight hearing as well last February, but I want to remind everyone about the VA's role and mandate. Um, our obligation is to all New Yorkers, not just to veterans, uh, which is an interesting perspective to be in. It's a critical point as it covers the lens through which we evaluate policy and make recommendations. Um, we are all veterans and therefore have a bias towards supporting veterans naturally um, and, and making, providing resources to them. Uh, but we make policy recommend recommendations based on what we believe is best for all citizens of New York City. We've established a vision for New York City to have the most effective local veteran policies of any large city in the United States, uh, and we're ju judicious in our recommendations. In partnership with the DVS, we have concluded that our policies will be most effective if prioritized based on how they support veterans' continued service as citizens. This is a guiding principle, and DVS has prioritized their resources with this principle in mind. As a result, all New Yorkers benefit from the investments that we make in our veterans. It's logical to question how these programs, uh, which are targeted at one specific population, the veterans, impact all New Yorkers. And to understand this, everyone must understand and recognize that whether, whether you like veterans or not, and I think most people do like veterans, but whether you do or not, they're unique compared to other demographics in the city. And I'll, I'll talk about three principal ways. First, they've chosen to, make them, to put themselves in harm's way for the benefit of their fellow citizens, and that in its own right merits our admiration and support. Ensuring that future generations of this country's best and brightest continue to serve is critical to our national security and our collective success. For validation of this concept, look no further than the words of our first president, who said the willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional to how they perceive veterans of early wars were treated and appreciated by our nation. 
Uh, with that, with the increase in activity in Afghanistan and all the rhetoric and action coming out of North Korea, this is just as true today as at any other time in our history. Second, veterans as a population have a variety of attributes which attract federal spending and tourism to the city. For example, events like Fleet Week and America's Parade and venues such as the Intrepid are all connected to veterans and all generate tourism and other benefits for the city. Also, the federal government has a, has a variety of programs which are targeted at veterans and which bring federal spending and other resources directly into our city. The most well-known of these programs, of course, is the GI Bill, but many other programs exist, and the direct impact of these uh, programs are, are the easiest to quantify economically. The last benefit to the city is difficult to evaluate, but certainly present. A wealth of demographic data suggests that veterans make great citizens. After their transition back, back to uh, regular citizenry, they are more civically active, have lower unemployment rates, higher wages, higher education, lower incarceration rates, higher average earnings, and ultimately pay more taxes. As such, policies designed to attract veterans are in the interest of the city and all citizens of New York. So let me, I'll give you one example. Mission Home, New, York's, uh, New York City's campaign to end veteran homelessness um, is, is a terrific example of how all these interplay. Since its inception, veteran homelessness has dropped by over 90 percent, despite an increase in, in homelessness for the city overall. While the city and its many partners have made significant investments, the simple fact is the majority of the direct costs to achieve this were funded by the federal government. So whenever, we, whenever a qualifying veteran was placed in permanent housing, federal dollars were paid to his or her New York City landlord, uh, which was spent here in the city. Further, the cost to service the otherwise homeless veteran, which was a great burden on, the city, on city resources, was then removed. That veteran who was once on the street, likely without a job, can now return uh, to being a contributing member of society and continue his or her service as a citizen, which connects back to our guiding principle. Lastly, all of that uh, experience garnered um, largely with federal dollars uh, among veterans can then be shared and applied throughout the city and other at-risk homeless populations, which may not be so well-funded as veterans. And the city is made more effective and efficient as a result of our, our veteran programs. Now, let me turn to the topic at, de at, at hand today, the Department of Veteran Services and, and the, the oversight assessment. Um, I'll start with the, the good, and then I'll end up with some suggestions at the end. So overall, we at the VAB, uh, much, much like this committee, are very pleased with the progress that the DVS has made since inception a little over a year ago. Um, the following items have been appropriately prioritized, and, and we've been resoundingly pleased with the success. So the first one, and I appreciate the committee mentioning this as well, um, the success of any per personnel, the success of any organization depends on the people. While the VAB isn't involved in specific hiring decisions, we have engaged with the commissioner and her team on the process, and we've been pleased with the quality and quantity of the candidates who have applied for the positions. The mission of serving veterans in New York City, combined with the entrepreneurial opportunity to establish the first new city agency in nearly a quarter of a century, has allowed DVS to tr attract some really high-quality talent. Um, next one, guiding principles and framework. The core four framework that the commissioner and her team have established, um, combined with the guiding principle established by the VA that, that I talked about, have laid the foundation for which to establish effective policies and programs. Further, as a proponent of small government and judicious use of resources, the DVS has rightly established itself as more of a coordinating agency facilitating veterans' access to existing city services rather than recreating capabilities and adding redundancy to, redundancies to existing programs. This makes the return on the city's investment in the Department of Veterans Services very high. Next one, partnership. As a follow-on to my last comment, the DVS has been particularly effective in partnering with other city agencies, uh, as well as public and private, and private ventures as well, to support veterans' access to these resources. DVS has brought together veterans' organizations, citizens, and other city agencies and organizations in a collaborative way which lifts all of them up and, and helps to improve all who are involved. Um, next one, Mission Home. I talked about this uh, briefly as well. DVS has really been a leader in the quest to eradicate vet veteran homelessness. Um, they will continue that fight as, as importantly as they have uh, uh, in sharing those lessons across, across the rest of the city uh, that we've learned from our population here so that other agencies uh, can benefit from the homeless programs throughout New York City. Uh, last one, national leadership. The DVS has established New York City as, as the leader nationwide in local veteran policies. Showing national leadership on this front is critical to our long-term success. If New, York is seen, if New York City is seen as a leader in this area, we will be chosen to pilot more projects for the VA and will garner disproportionate state and federal and other resources. 
This is certainly of interest of all New Yorkers, and the support that we've seen recently um, out of the, the, uh, the Hidden Heroes campaign, choosing New York as a, as a benchmark city, perfectly uh, highlights that point. So New York City, because of its great programs, then gets more resources uh, thrown our way. So despite these great successes, and there certainly are more, the Commissioner touched on many of them, um, that the DVS has had to, to date, there's a number of areas where it could be improved. And some of these areas are internal focus items for the Department, and some of them the DVS is going to need the help of the Council and the Administration to provide more funding and resources. Uh, the first one I'll mention, which has already been mentioned, and, and frankly the, uh, the Committee here has been, has been ahead on this topic, which is contracting, cap contracting capability. Um, we've discussed this need uh, quite at length, and I was initially, personally, I was initially opposed to having a dedicated resource uh, because I don't like redundancy. However, having observed the first year in operation, I'm firmly convinced that the DVS, um, which I think is the only, actually the only agency that doesn't have a contracting capability, um, requires its own dedicated resources. Contracting delays results in program, or contracting delays result in program delays, which means wasted resources. Further, there's unique attributes, as many have cited, uh, that members in the veterans community have hold, such as veteran service organizations, which are not a 501c3 and which DCAS is less familiar with. I'll give you a recent example at our last VAB meeting uh, in the Rockaway, Queens. Michael Kane, the president of the Queens chapter of the VVA, was seeking um, actually getting payment on the $5,000 direct grant, which I believe the council had provided him, and still, still that was sort of lost in, uh, in the DCAS process. Um, and, and, you know, rightly so, DCAS is administrating a $70 billion budget, um, uh, but I can certainly tell you uh, Mr. O'Kane and his constituents uh, felt like that was very important. So simply put, DVS needs more resources to bring this about, and I ask you guys to continue to push that, uh, push that as I'm sure you will. Next one, vets on campus. Um, in, in my testimony at the VAB oversight hearing, I highlighted an exciting opportunity that, that in my assessment is the highest return uh, program yet to be created in, in New York City here. And that's, that's Vets on Campus, NYC. Um, as a reminder, New York City is the largest exporter of post-secondary education of any city in the nation, so it's a critical, critical item for the city. Um, few opportunities to improve the lives of Americans are so widely celebrated and noted as post-secondary education. And this is very much aligned with our guiding principle of supporting veterans' continued service as citizens. Um, what's even more amazing is the fact that the federal government will pay for all of this. So just simply put, the federal government will pay for every, every qualifying veteran to go to school, which is the vast majority of them, qualify for GI Bill, ben Bill benefits. Those who seek a four-year degree in, in, the New York City, uh, in New York City um, will spend approximately $200,000 of federal, federal resources will be spent on their education, the majority of which is through housing, uh, but then a good bit also through, uh, through tuition, et cetera. This program and supporting this is an absolute no-brainer. DVS has made great progress on this initiative with no funding, with no direct funding on this program. Um, for example, last week over 80 people representing over 30 institutions joined a planning session uh, hosted at Columbia University, and the interest was electric. So I asked the council and administration to continue to provide further resources to build this program out and ensure New York remains the leader in supporting veteran education. And veterans should all want to continue their adventure here in New York City, even if they don't stay here, even if they just come here to study. Um, next one, program evaluation. Uh, I, the, the DVS is staffed that doesn't have specific people aligned with program evaluation. And in order to make sure that, that the, our policies and programs are effective and efficient, they need resources to measure those. So I asked the council to, to ensure that the administration and their budget provides resources uh, to do that and, and please support that effort. Um, next one is communications, and a lot of you guys, I'm, I'm glad, uh, as usual, this committee is ahead of, ahead of topics, but um, in, in my assessment, I think communications, in terms of the, the, the capability that DVS has been provided with, I think communications is the area um, that most needs some work. Um, there's probably some additional funding, but the DVS needs to make this a priority, and I believe they are, but they still need to make more progress in this way. This should include both communicating within the city and being able to reach our veterans, whether it's through social media or otherwise, um, but also continuing to communicate the successes beyond the city's borders um, so that we can continue to garner more resources, as I talked about earlier. Next one is VetConnect. VetConnect, uh, as the commissioner talked about, is an innovative platform through which all the New York City's veteran services are intending to be coordinated. Um, we believe we've got the right partners identified and, and that the critical, uh, uh, and it will be critical in getting the funding needed to complete the program. 
Uh, the Commissioner mentioned that this should be up and running in about six months. Um, however, the, the, the discussions in the process around contracting have taken longer than ha has been anticipated because I believe about six months ago they intended for this to be live. And so we need to, this, this further highlights the need to, to push the contracting capability, and I think we need to continue to push to get this Vet Connect program out there so that we can um, coordinate all these services and resources don't get lost. Um, the last one that I'll highlight here is a veteran-owned business preference. Uh, most major corporations have this. Uh, New York State has it, federal government has it. New York City can't be a leader in veteran policies without such a program. DVS could design its own program, um, but I believe that a much more effective and efficient means of establishing this is to just extend the Minority and Women-Owned Business Enterprise Program, which is an, a tremendous program that I think the Council has been instrumental in, in supporting. Um, they should just extend that same, same definition to a veteran-owned business. Um, and so this is an area where, I, where I'd ask the Council to take action to support that. Um, that concludes my planned, uh, planned remarks. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. We'll, we'll save questions for the end. Joe, did you want to add anything on behalf of the VAB? No. Okay. All right. So why don't we move down the, uh, the row here, and uh, this is the next panel. Thank you, Councilman Ulrich and members of the committee for the opportunity to provide testimony regarding the work of the New York City Department of Veterans Services. My name is Lisa First. I'm the Assistant Vice President of the Center for Policy, Advocacy, and Education of the Mental Health Association of New York City. For more than 50 years, MHA has provided direct services, public education, and advocacy to address the needs of New Yorkers living with behavioral health needs. MHA oversees the Veterans Mental Health Coalition of New York City, a coalition of more than 900 members which seeks to improve the quality of and access to behavioral health services for veterans, active duty military service members, and their families. The VMHC provides education and training opportunities to individuals from a variety of service sectors who directly serve or are interested in serving these populations. Training and educational efforts focus on building knowledge and skills that will broaden the capacity of providers to identify and address the behavioral health needs of veterans. MHA and the VMHC supported the creation of DVS in 2016 to meet the needs of New York City's more than 200,000 veterans and applauds the agency's ongoing work, particularly with regard to its comprehensive approach to addressing the mental health and emotional well-being of veterans through its core four whole health model. This innovative model, which you heard about earlier, provides an integrated approach to mental health through its attention not only to addressing the needs of veterans with clinically significant behavioral health conditions, but also through supporting resilience by helping veterans become connected with psychosocial supports, such as peer mentors and social engagement opportunities. This integrated approach is in keeping with the current best practices in behavioral health, as it has been demonstrated that the most positive outcomes occur when supports are able to consider multiple domains of functioning, including social, emotional, and mental health. The VMHC has partnered with DVS to support the implementation of the core four whole health model, and most significantly has worked with DVS in developing the core three aspect of the model, which seeks to identify holistic services that are demonstrated to support beneficial clinical outcomes, but which may not always be offered within the traditional behavioral health services sector. Examples of such services include yoga, mindfulness meditation techniques, and other types of interventions. The VMHC has worked with DVS to identify evidence-based holistic modalities to which New York City's veterans may be referred and will continue to work with DVS to help develop a sustainable model of delivery of holistic services to veterans, and I should add their families as well. DVS is currently working to acquire New York Serves, as it's currently known, which as you heard earlier is the information referral and case coordination network linking veterans to a variety of service providers across, across a wide variety of sectors, including housing, employment, and behavioral health, among others. Upon its acquisition by DVS, New York Serves will be rebranded as VetConnect, as you heard. MHA has been working with the current administrators of New York Serves to help support its efforts to identify veterans with behavioral health needs and connect them to qualified providers throughout the city. Where MHA is also working with NY Serves administrators to determine effective ways to work collaboratively with and integrate it, the services of New York City Well, the city's front door to behavioral health services that uses state-of-the-art telephone text and web-based based technologies to respond to the mental health needs of tens of thousands of New Yorkers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and which is administered by MHA. MHA looks forward to its continued work with DVS to support its efforts to meet the mental health challenges of veterans and their families. 
MHA and the VMHC are grateful for the New York City Council's leadership and commitment to addressing the needs of New York City veterans and their families, including their behavioral health needs. We greatly appreciate the DVS Commissioner, Dr. Lori Sutton, for her leadership and dedication to meeting the integrated needs of veterans and their families. MHA looks forward to continued work with the Council and the current administration to continue to make New York City a place where the emotional well-being of veterans, active duty military, and their families can flourish. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Uh, First. And now we will hear from <clears throat> Kristen Rouse, New York City Veterans Alliance. Good afternoon, Chair Ulrich and the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. And I do um, want to comment in a full agreement that we are, we are indeed a long way away from the, the days of MOVA. And, uh, and thank you for that. Uh, my name is Kristen Rouse. I served for more than 20 years of combined service in the United States Army, Army Reserve, and the New York National Guard, which included three tours of duty in Afghanistan. I'm here today to testify on behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, a member-supported grassroots policy advocacy and empowerment organization serving veterans, service members, and their families across the New York City metropolitan area. The New York City Veterans Alliance was a key advocacy voice in the creation of the Department of Veterans Services as an independent agency, and we have been the premier community voice advocating to grow DVS's budget to the current $4.4 million allotted for fiscal year 2018. Our membership strongly supports our continued work to set high expectations for the role of DVS in New York City and beyond, and there is much to be optimistic about as DVS continues to build a staff of impressive prof professionals and to continue its impactful work, such as the tracking and coordination of care and permanent housing for homeless veterans. But we, but we must emphasize before our city's leaders that there is much more yet to be done. As we approach the two-year mark from the announcement of, that the agency so many of us advocated for would become a reality, DVS has lagged behind in its ability to serve its chartered mission and yield the results that are appropriate given the tremendous investment it, that our community and the taxpayers are making. DVS has billed itself as a startup, which while initially was a helpful illustration of the groundbreaking role of this new agency, Nevertheless, over time has seemed to only serve as an excuse for its shortcomings or its delayed uh, rolling out of programs or all of the programs that we continuously hear about that are still yet to come. As a contrast, the New York City Veterans Alliance, we are an actual startup. And my team members in the room, who are back here, raise your, raise your hands, folks. Thank you. Um, the mem my members in the room can tell you about the sacrifices that they have made in our startup process to make a tremendous impact on a very limited budget. We have worked tirelessly to provide our community with information and to advocate for results and accountability from DVS and other government agencies. We've influenced a number of local laws, and our members were key to the drafting, introduction, and passage of Introduction 1259, which will, will go into effect this November, to protect veterans and military members from housing and employment discrimi discrimination here in our city. We have also trained and supported our membership as they enter the arena of public service. And we have done so only because of the support of some 500 members and donors who have believed in our ability to get results. Meanwhile, it is frustrating to see that the agency we work so hard to create at this time, in our view, appears to be vastly bloated in budget dollars in comparison with the results it has borne for our community. As specified in this year's budget, a third of DVS's staff are in the salary range earning more than $100,000 a year, placing them within the top earning 11% of city employees. As the head of DVS, Commissioner Sutton oversees a staff of now up to 40, uh, which is an, a dollar amount that is only slightly less than what the commissioner of the FDNY receives as annual compensation uh, for overseeing more than 14,000 personnel. This simply isn't the budget or salary range of a startup, and it sets a vi very high bar for our community's expectations of high performance and solid, measurable results showing how our city's approximately 210,000 veterans are being served appropriately. Uh, we, below in our testimony, we list a few of the areas where we see DVS lagging uh, to meet its responsibilities. Um, I'm not going to read all of these in detail. It's, it's entered into the record in our testimony, but uh, we want to mention the, the shortage of flags provided to VSOs for Memorial Day. Uh, the, that number was reduced this year. Uh, the number of interred veterans has not been re reduced. 
Um, DVS's Facebook page, for example, was down for at least five weeks uh, between late May and early July of this year, uh, which halted its digital outreach and is very disappointing for a fully funded agency uh, with a budget of about $4 million. Um, as of this morning, there are no, no minutes posted um, as mandated um, of VAB meetings uh, since November 2016. Uh, the link to video recordings is a broken link, uh, so the public cannot access that information. Um, VAB members are either, uh, there are three of them that have expired terms of service. There are two more whose term of service will expire within the next month. Uh, and there's nothing posted on the website letting the public or our community know uh, what the status is of that. Um, we, the DVS uh, reported this uh, earlier today that 7,000 veterans and family members have been served, uh, but we have not seen the qualitative data of, of what that exactly mean. Uh, to, to include the 2,000 uh, people who are attending theater of war performances, uh, in what way are they being served? And, and how are we measuring uh, those, those impacts of these programs? Um, we also have yet to see how, um, how the agency's outreach specialists and the work that they are doing um, to, to connect veterans and family members with, with benefits and to resolve issues, uh, how is that currently integrated into NY Serves and how will that be further integrated into the Vets Connect program? Um, last year, Vets Connect uh, received uh, a significant amount of funding. This year, in fiscal year 2018, they're, they're scheduled to receive more than $800,000 and we, we're not seeing the quanti qualitative data on, on how that money is being spent. Um, the emphasis on Theater of War, uh, which is a $1.3 million program funded by uh, external organizations and run by external organizations, um, DVS is nevertheless spending a, a large and inordinate amount of time of staffing and resources to plan, promote, and execute these performances, many of which are with organizations around the city that do not serve veterans. Um, this program has not yielded clear metrics of any kind for the New York City veterans community and appears uh, at best to be a diversion from its chartered mission and responsibilities. So just as investors in startup ventures need to see a detailed accounting of the outcomes they are getting for each dollar they spend, New York City taxpayers should be asking the same. We again recommend, as we did earlier this year, that DVS put into place a chief contracting officer, as we're, as we're discussing here, to manage city funds being provided to community organizations serving veterans. We further recommend that DVS appoint personnel, adequate personnel, to manage the growth and function of a fully-fledged city agency, to include experienced staffing to appropriately manage procurement and human resources, to ensure that the agency is fully capable in managing the business of a city agency. Furthermore, DVS must serve as a model for all other city agencies and offices in its employment practices and fostering career growth for veterans, including those with disabilities, and members of our National Guard and Reserve. The funding is there, and it has been there, for DVS to focus on growth, growth strategy, management, and producing quantifiable, lasting results for our community as a fully-fledged city agency. We look forward to continued dialogue and partnership with the agency as it continues to grow and work toward this end. On behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Pending your questions, this concludes my testimony. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you very much. And uh, to the members of the panel, thank you. I have a, just a few questions for the VAB, and then I'll um, address some of the other points that were raised. Um, Mr. Haskins, or Chair Haskins, at some of these uh, uh, borough meetings that you're having, I know you're, you're taking them around to the uh, respective uh, boroughs throughout the city. What are some of the experiences that people are sharing, if any, or interactions, stories about their interactions with DVS? What, what, what type of feedback are you getting regarding DVS from veterans in the respective boroughs, if you want to share or are you inclined to? Sure, yeah. I, I would say I would characterize the majority of the engagement um, in the meetings well, let me, let me take one step back. One, the, the, the actual level of attendance is low, uh, lower than we would like it to be, um, and that's part of my commentary around communications. Obviously, we as a, the VAB is a body of people who are volunteers and don't have a staff, et cetera. 
Um, we rely on DVS to get the word out about the meetings, and, and that's uh, part of my observations on the communications are seen through that lens because I think they're I think that's, that's one area in terms of outreach to the community that um, where investment needs to be made so that whatever, you know, whether it's VAB meetings or other topics relevant to veterans, just be in better, um, better position to make sure that they know about it because some meetings are quite heavily intended and some are not. Um, I think the majority of the, the uh, feedback for, for those where we do get feedback, uh, the majority of the questions I think have been quite constructive, uh, more so than in the earlier days when, when um, when sometimes people got off on a tangent and would focus on very individual issues. Um, people have gotten much better about, uh, about focusing on questions that were uh, of impact to the broader community. Um, generally, they're more education-oriented. What is the DVS doing? What's, what, um, what programs have been established? Trying to understand the recent changes in legislation, et cetera. So I'd say it's much, much uh, the, the number of, of new inquiries that we get are, are relatively low in terms of new topics that are covered. Um, it's much more about getting educated on what, you know, what is DVS doing, what capabilities do they have, how can they help me and whatever group that I happen to, to happen to have. And, and, and one of the nice things that has been there is um, the DVS has done a pretty good job of staffing each of the meetings so that as people raise questions that, that uh, you, you know, where, where, as people raise questions, they can actually address the issues right there. We've also had members of the VA attend as well that, that can help try and connect um, connect people where the, where it's relevant VA services uh, right you know right on site. Uh, Joe, did you want to add anything to that? I saw you yeah. made a gesture. Um, yeah, uh, I would say roughly about um, two thirds of people who come to the VAB meetings want to talk about the VA, and because it's a national issue, we've we've actually brought in the VA to answer some of those questions. Uh, some of the other besides education has been city wise has been uh, vendors. You know those things. Uh, just to correct some of the record too, uh, the VAB members' terms do not come up until April of this coming year, of 2018. So we are looking to have the uh, speaker and the mayor, whoever the speaker may be, uh, make appointments very quick to the board. And guarantee it won't be either of us. Like you said. <laughs> well, maybe, mine for and, obvious reasons, and maybe Paul Valone's too. I don't know. And um, just, I will also note that the alliance is well repre represented at our uh, meetings. Yeah. Uh, they weren't at the last meeting in Queens, but they were at the last one in July. Neither was and they, I, by they, the way. They did I was talk about. It, they did talk make. about the uh, legislation that got passed. So we are mindful that they are there. Um, other than that, then we'd like to hear more from them. So that seems to be one of the issues as well. I think but. what might really help, as Councilmember Cabrera uh, recommended to the commissioner, was if, if the city found a small portion of their budget um, that they could pay directly to Facebook for advertising, where you can micro-target and actually select people by borough and by branch of service. I mean, they do allow for different curies, I guess, that you could search through, and then they would tell you exactly how many people. It's very inexpensive. It would probably be a couple of hundred dollars at the most, maybe, and then promote some of the VAB meetings that way. Um, the other thing, which is a lot more expensive, but maybe uh, uh, far be it for me to give the mayor any recommendation these days, but uh, they should do a, a teletown hall. Um, I did them several times in the past. They were very popular, but they are very, very expensive. Yes. I think it cost me one time uh, $4,000 or somewhere in that range just to do a one-hour teletown hall. It's almost like a radio show where you dial out, but people can also dial in, and then you have some, you know, people can ask questions and you can mute them and get to more points. But um, considering how many homebound veterans that we have that aren't able to make it to events but may have legitimate concerns or issues, it might be something that uh, they want to do in the future. But I, the teletown halls are very popular. And sometimes they're a lot of fun, and um, you can screen some of the people so that you're actually getting to more people, and you're not getting stuck on a person with a very particular issue. But um, so, and, and I hear a constant theme here, and I think this, the administration hears a theme here today about communication, and they know they need to improve on a communication. There are ways that they can improve communication, and I, I'm pretty confident that they will because it's a very constructive. Uh, Recommendation, yeah, Joe. Yeah, just the last thing I want to say is I, I cannot um, tell you what DVS does when I when they when they get the minutes or what they do with the video. Uh, on that part, I agree with Kristen. But as a secretary, I can assure you I have submitted all the minutes. I work okay. with Todd on the annual report. 
Our, our administrative wise, the VAB is good. So. I have a feeling the minutes will be up by tomorrow. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I have a feeling that all the minutes that you've submitted will be. Um, you know what might make it easier is maybe you email them the minutes in addition to printing it out, and they could just you know convert it to PDF and upload it. I don't know. I'm just. We do. I don't know. I don't need to know how to make the sausages. I just want to eat them. So, uh, but I think that. Uh, Again, just put everything into perspective. Four years ago, five of us were sitting in a room. Uh, Mr. Daniels is also with the Lord now. He's, he's no longer with us. But when I first walked in, I said, where the hell am I? And, uh, and now, look at, look at all the stakeholders. Look at all the people, and many of whom aren't getting paid to be here. They took time off from work because they care about veterans, and they know that we can do something to help them, and we are doing stuff. Uh, to help them. There are some growing pains. I would probably categorize some of Kristen's remarks. The only one I, I kind of disagree with is the salary range. It is a very expensive city to live in, and if you want to attract the best talent, if you really care about veterans, and I know you do, certainly, and I do as well, you have to pay people commensurate with their experience, and it's just so hard even when you're paying $100,000 to attract the type of talent that you need, some of which requires a very, you know, highly educated or sophisticated training in a particular field. And uh, I don't gripe them for that. At one time, I used to attack MOVA because half of their budget was the commissioner's salary. And I said, there's something wrong with that, right? I mean, that was a, an issue. But the, uh, the police department, the fire department, the sanitation department, um, as you pointed out, they have a senior staff, and they also get paid a lot of money. But if they were to go into the private field, the private sector, which many of them do after they retire, they're making twice the money as consultants and, and doing other things. So, um, so I will defend their right to pay people uh, what they're worth, and I want them to pay commensurate, fair wages and uh, good salaries, but I want them to hire very good people, which I think they've done. I have, I, in every single instance that my office or me, myself, that we've interacted with someone at DVS, and most of the time it's not the commissioner, it's one of the people that she's hired. They have been responsive, they've been helpful, they've been respectful, polite, even with some of the people that are just very difficult to deal with. They have just handled themselves with remarkable composure, and I just, you know, it's... They've got a tough job, but I think they're doing a good job, by and large. If, so, if I might follow yeah. up on that, but also it's the uh, to, just to clarify, uh, Councilman, t that it's it's not that we don't want people duly compensated for for their good work and their great experience, and uh, it, it is that with high salaries comes high come high expectations for results, and uh, and to be in sort of the second year of. Uh, of hearing a lot of comments on, well, we're getting to it. Well, this is six months later. Um, you know, for for example, the the, you the, know, vet, the vets connect issue. I, I intentionally didn't bring it up. I know it was mentioned. We're going to bring that up at the budget hearing because it was included in the budget uh, last uh, yes. uh, year. Well, this mm -hmm. fiscal year, you know, 2017, 2017, fiscal year 2017. Sorry. And that will be a, a hot topic at the preliminary budget hearing mm -hmm. in the spring because we're going to be expecting to see, you know, where they are in the contracting. Pro hopefully, at that point, they're fully contracted and and it will be rolled out in in phase. I mean, we're very eager to, uh, to see how that works because I, I don't think any other city has ever tried this before. If I'm, I mean, a city as large as New York. I so it'll be the first. Um, so it, I expect there to be some growing pains there too. But or, or even just the basic communications of having the correct information on the website. I appreciate, I appreciate hearing what the VAB is actually doing, but what is on the website is, is and I understand it's not in the VAB's point. control, it is not correct. Yeah, and no, so, so I'm glad that we have a hearing like this to update you're the, right. the actual information. You're, you, are, you are correct, and like I said, I'm sure some of that information will be up probably, knowing uh, Dr. Sutton, it will probably be up later today or tomorrow at the latest, but uh, in terms of the minutes and things and contact information, uh, that's very important. But, you know, getting back to uh, the overarching theme, the only criticism that I really hear today is regarding communication, and I have to say, um, you know, it works both ways. The good work that they do, they should be putting out press releases and, and letting people know some of the good things that they're doing, getting the word out there so people know that the department exists. So it's not just the, you know, communication in a negative way, it's also in a positive way. We have to sort of reinforce in the public's mind the good work that the agency is doing and, um, you know, th their press shop, you know, needs to send that to the local papers and to the dailies and, and um, Part of the problem is, Kristen, as you know, in this city, 
The press has an appetite for veterans' issues twice a year, Veterans Day and Memorial Day. And for us, it's a concern all year round. And, you know, we send press releases and they don't make the papers and it's not always our fault, but, um, but we still have to send them and communicate better. And also for the record, the, you know, if DVS wanted to work with community partners such as the New York City Veterans Alliance on potentially joint releases, partnerships, I mean, this is another way to get in the media. Um, my organization was just mentioned on CNN. I mean, it's not like the, the work is, uh, the, the appetite is out there for the right angle of the stories, and that's something that, you know, we could work together on. Uh, we, you know, the Alliance has a, has a, has, we have worked, you know, on a very limited budget to create a large media outreach. Um, you know, we have an email list of more than 8,000 that we are glad to um, publicize via B meetings and encourage uh, all members of the community you know, all members of the community to attend any VA meetings, VAB meetings when they happen. Uh, and uh, I have also previously offered to the VAB to, to publicize other, other uh, associated events. We've talked about this. Right. And uh, we, we're glad to publicize more information from DVS. I'm and we, we have, we've, you know, our Facebook outreach we can right. we can help to augment I if, if we were to work together. That you will reconsider not to air laundry or anything, but I would hope that you would reconsider your previous decision to serve on the VAB, because I know that the speaker wanted to appoint you in particular to serve on the VAB, and at the time you had a million other things going on, and you know you were stretched pretty thin in your commitments. But in the future, I think that you would be a strong asset uh, to the VAB. And I think one of the ways to improve the VAB and to approve DVS is to become a, a part of it. And I would hope that you might consider that because you have a wealth of knowledge, experience, expertise, and a network that I don't have and, and Todd Haskins doesn't have and, and Dr. Sutton uh, doesn't have. And I think that we really need to tap into that. I, I hope you would lend yourself to at least considering it because I would personally make the case to uh, whoever the speaker is, again, it won't be me or Paul Vallone. I just took him out of the race. I just took him out of the race for because speaker. Because I was in him out. But I would personally <laughs> lobby very strongly uh, to see you appointed to the VAB because every voice counts, and it's not about group think. And your testimony today is very valid and very helpful because every opinion counts and every voice counts. And you even having the courage to come here every month and testify, and sometimes it's in favor of what we're doing, and sometimes it's not. I commend you and I thank you uh, because you, I believe, are a very courageous person, and I respect and admire you personally, and I want you to help me make these things better. So uh, that's my I opinion. join in that, Chair. Thank you to you and the advocates. And as we may not be speaker, we certainly chose to be on veterans. This is where our heart is. That's why we're always here. So. And I may not be chair. Don't forget. So <laughs> there's new Lots chairs of and <laughs> everything else. So sometimes the devil you know, you know, they say. Anyway. All right. Why don't we get to the next panel? Thank you. Thank you so much. All of, uh, and Lisa, thank you as well. Thank you. All right. The last panel we'll hear from is Mr. Anthony Pike, representing IAVA, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, and also uh, Mr. Tawaki Korematsu, representing himself. Mr. Pike and Mr. Korematsu. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. OK, I know there, there are some other folks that are going to stay from DVS, right, for the last panel. Oh, great. All right. I have a feeling some of these, uh, yeah, all right. Issues might come up that you could help address. Okay. 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 We will uh, just go in order that people signed up to speak. So we'll start with Mr. Pike, and we will end with Mr. Korematsu, if that's all right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, microphone is working. Perfect. Thank you, Chairman Ulrich and distinguished members of the committee. On behalf of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America and our more than 400,000 members, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify here today on the oversight of the new New York City Department of Veterans Services. My name is Anthony Pike, and I am the Deputy National Field Director at Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. I am also a Marine Corps veteran who has served two tours in Iraq. After 13 years, IVA has become the preferred empowerment organization for post-9-11 veterans. 
While our members are spread throughout the nation, we are proud to say that our national headquarters is located right here in the great city of New York. Since its beginning, IVA has fought for and has been successful in advocating for policies that are able to meet the needs of our newest generation of veterans, which includes our advocacy towards the creation of the DVS. A great deal of IAVA's advocacy pertains to fighting to empower veterans in Washington, D.C. However, it is also our view that helping veterans return home is a responsibility of all Americans, which includes state and local governments. That is why DVS is so important. For veterans who live in New York City, DVS has enormous potential to assist them in attaining housing and employment, expanding their educational opportunities, and promoting their transition from military to civilian life, among other matters. Our primary concerns regarding DVS in this particular oversight hearing are that while DVS is well manned and funded, DVS has not had the overall positive impact that New York City veterans and taxpayers expect them to. This is unacceptable, and it is exactly why vigorous oversight by this committee is needed. In advocating within the halls of Washington, D.C., IVA has found that strong government oversight is critical in ensuring that veterans get the benefits they need and that those benefits have a positive impact on their lives. This oversight, conducted properly, does justice to both veterans and the public servants that serve them. Oversight ensures that an agency is faithfully executing the policies it is responsible for, that the public servants that work within an agency are adequately empowered to do their jobs, and that the agency's clients, in this case New York City veterans, are receiving positive outcomes in utilizing the agency's services. With an adopted budget of $4.4 million for the next fiscal year, DVS should be at the forefront of caring for and empowering New York City veterans. However, this has not been the case. Many IAVA veterans have reached out to our own Rapid Response Referral Program to share the shortfalls of DVS in serving veterans. One of these shortfalls is, that the, is the disconnect between DVS employees and New York City veterans advocates, to include IAVA. Several New York City veterans advocates have told us that while many DVS officials mean well, they frequently are not receptive to their professional opinions in addressing veterans' issues. Allowing the status quo where DVS shuts out the very advocates that helped create the department lends itself to a loss of trust and missed opportunities in serving the veterans. This disconnect is further evident within DVS's Veterans Advisory Board, the VAB. According to the DVS's own website, the purpose of the VAB is to hold regular meetings and through these meetings, New York City veterans ensure the lines of communications are maintained and cultivate an active community. Yet in these meetings that our own staff have attended, it is obvious that the VAB meetings are conducted with little direction and have produced minimal value. Um, another concern of ours is the issue of the DVS salaries, specifically our viewpoint that some of those salaries are excessive. Within, the, within its budget, DVS has one-third of its employees making over $100,000 annually, placing these staffers among the top earning 11% of New York City government employees. This is on top of the fact that the commissioner who leads DVS is the second highest paid special assistant that Mayor de Blasio has appointed. We fought hard for DVS to be established and well-funded. IVA has also fought hard against a proposed decrease of $317,000 of the budget earlier this year. However, IVA and our allies fought for those funds so they can be utilized to serve New York City veterans, not improperly enrich the city officials. For the sake of our veterans and taxpayers, we encourage the committee to look into this. This issue of excessive salaries is further compounded when placed together with actual programs and outcomes that the DVS has produced, which are not impressive. A prime example of this is the Theater of War Productions, which is being managed by both DVS and the city's Department of Cultural Affairs. According to the DVS website, uh, TO, DVS, and DCLA will implement a two-year social impact project with and for veterans in their communities across New York City. The project uses theater and a variety of other media to help communities discuss and address public health and social issues. While well-meaning, IVA sees such a project as having little value to our veterans in the city as a whole, especially when too many uh, city veterans will still struggle with issues regarding housing, education, employment, and mental health. Programs of artistic expression for veterans are a nice adjunct as long as they are not a drain on the time and resources of the DVS. And while the $1.4 million budget being used to fund this project comes from philanthropic funds, it is our view that the taxpayer-funded shepherding of this project by DVS is money and time that could be more effectively used to help veterans in their everyday lives. Thus, it is our view that DVS's shepherding of this program should be suspended or drawn down. 
Fundamentally, we must be committed to adequately addressing the challenges that New York City veterans face, not covering them up with hollow and unneeded displays of support. IABA is a data-driven organization, and as such, we have always advocated that metrics be applied in assessing veteran outcomes so that they can provide the best outcomes to those veterans being served. We are sure that if asked, DVS supervisors could provide a wide range of their agency's accomplishments, but without organizational metrics to, to access them as concrete outcomes, creates an image that is dubious at best and deceitful at worst. Examples of some of our metric-related recommendations as they relate to veterans on the national level can be studied in depth within IVA's policy agenda, including setting outcome metrics to better define the impact of treatment methods for invisible wounds such as PTSD or major depression, streamline and focus the Veterans Health Administration organizational performance measures, and establish the same in personnel performance and measuring systems, require schools that receive GI Bill funds to report on the progress of student veterans, to include data to collection to provide oversight of school performance and student successes. These are metrics that can and should be applied towards DVS programs. IVA itself has applied metrics as a service standard to our rapid response referral program, which is staffed by our own team of master's level veteran transition managers, case managers who assist veterans worldwide in confronting significant challenges like unemployment, financial or legal struggles, homelessness, and mental health related issues. We do this by sending surveys every single time we make a referral and when the cases are closed. The client is able to rank every referral we make on quality, timeliness, effectiveness, and customer service of each one of our referral partners. We also provide the opportunity for the clients to grade our own staff members, as well as the, the case managers that they work with, using the same metrics once the case is closed. <coughs> At IAVA, we believe in candor, and by, and by providing the veterans we serve that opportunity to grade our own services and provide feedback this way has enabled us to make continuous improvements to our own RIP program. In fact, we are currently in the process of adding even more metrics to our assessments in order to better understand our population, better serve our clients, and make targeted improvements. Lastly, IAVA is concerned that the VetConnect New York City program has not been provided all the tools it needs in order to fulfill its mission of providing a digital infrastructure for veterans to gain citywide access to benefits, assistance, and resources. Our RIP team's interactions with the VetConnect New York City, we have found them to be very responsive and well-weaning, but have had challenges integrating both of our systems in serving the city veterans. One of the challenges is a burdensome increase in the amount of digital paperwork needed to sync the work of our RIP team and that of VetConnect New York City. Last year, VetConnect was budgeted $116,000, since then, they have substantially increased their funding for FY18 up to over $884,000. As VetConnect continues to find its footing as a platform, we encourage this committee to provide them with the oversight and tools that they need to be a successful program. Given the challenges that veterans encounter when transitioning from military to civilian life, it is absolutely critical that this committee conduct proper oversight of the department. Doing so does right by the men and women who have sacrificed to serve this nation. Members of the committee, I thank you again for the opportunity, opportunity to share IVA's views on the issues today. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pike. <clears throat> and again, I'm, I'm just going to uh, reiterate the uh, topic of VetConnect will definitely be a main focus at the preliminary budget hearings, and uh, we will be asking many questions of the department as to, you know, the associated costs and uh, the cause for delay and whatever other issues uh, which we know are um, which we know are there but hopefully we are looking forward to being rolled out soon and I'm pretty optimistic it will be a good thing um, I may have one question uh, but I'll save it for after Mr. Korematsu's testimony so uh, Mr. Korematsu uh, at your leisure please um, hi, are we meant to push the button if you can there's a button there Hi, we met previously. Um, I'm a U.S. Navy veteran, and it's going to be hard to follow what he just stated. He, in fact, he could be my spokesman, spokesperson for all intents and purposes. It kind of leads me to be curious as to whether DVS uh, shares some of the same personnel as HRA that you and I have previously discussed um, for a variety of reasons. Um, I gave you some documents to look over when you have time. Um, today there's been some discussion about how well veterans have been served in terms of the homelessness issue. Um, there's been some testimony uh, 
I'm bad with names, but let me cut to the chase. Um, I've applied more than 20 jobs, more than 20 times f uh, with city agencies for jobs. The mayor made statements on Veterans Day last year in which he uh, fraudulently claimed to have the backs of veterans. The reason why I say he fraudulently made that claim is because after making those 20 applications to city agencies for which he has control over, um, not once was I granted an interview, and I'm fully qualified for each and every one of those 20 applications. So how do you reconcile the applications 20 times with jobs I'm fully qualified for and never once got an interview? Um, the first remark he made on that date, or the first pertinent remark was, anyone who has a job that they're looking to fill, fill it with a veteran, do something for your country. Second remark, when you hire a veteran, I guarantee you, you will not only be doing the right thing, you will be doing yourself a favor because they're that good. Um, with regards to this point, there was actually a meeting, I believe, back in July, um, where the controller and public advocate maintained their offices. There were a group of veterans sitting in a room talking about um, how hard it is to find jobs with the city, despite the fact that we're supposed to be granted a preference for civil service jobs. So if it is the case that we're supposed to be granted a preference, then why is it that we're not being granted interviews? And in fact, if there are position, positions that we've held in the private sector previously, and we then try to find employment with those same types of positions in the public sector, um, yeah, why can't we be granted an interview and have a decision made on the merits as to whether to hire us for that position? Um, earlier today, there was also a meeting in front of City Hall with the, the public advocate about trying to have firms that do business with the city not subject workers to forced arbitration. Um, I brought it to the attention of the commissioner of uh, HRA that unfortunately I, I'm still a victim of wage theft that dates back five years. One of their uh, vendors is the same company that retaliated against me five years ago when I blew the whistle about the fact that they were illegally withholding overtime payment from me. So I submitted a FOIL request to HRA that uncovered the fact that the same, could I curse, a-hole um, who had me fired five years ago signed that same business letter with HRA. So the question becomes, should taxpayers really be footing the bill um, to support a company that stole my pay five years, five years ago, for which there have been severe repercussions, and that still persists. Um, the mayor has also been having public town hall meetings that are subject to New York State's open meetings law. In spite of the fact that the New York State's open meetings law exists, there's a Supreme Court decision pertaining to viewpoint discrimination, meaning if you are the mayor and I'm a protester, if I disagree with your positions and I want to call you out about the fact that you made uh, frivolous claims, um, if I'm not being allowed into those public meetings that are financed by taxpayers, then who in this room can have my back in, in support of the same oath we all took when we joined the military to protect and defend the Constitution from all enemies, both foreign and, and domestic? So, meaning, if the mayor previously said on March 15th at a town hall in Chelsea that he's interested in learning about waste, fraud, and corruption, if I'm a whistleblower and I can blow the whistle, if I can substantiate those claims, and despite that, I can't walk into the same room as other members of the public to save their cash. Isn't there something seriously wrong about that? And with regards to the documents I gave you, um, I had a job interview scheduled on August 18th of last year. The only reason I didn't perform well is that I took 15 punches to my left temple on July 2nd of last year, was diagnosed with a concussion on July 30th of last year. HRA was put on notice on March 16th of last year that their business partner, Urban Pathways, committed a bait-and-switch bait and fraud upon me and other tenants in the same housing uh, for military veterans in the Bronx, meaning on one date we signed one lease agreement. After we signed that lease agreement that is fully enforceable, um, Urban Pathways took it upon themselves to materially change the terms of that lease agreement such that I had a mentally unstable roommate thrust upon my hands who tried assaulting me on May 12th and was physically restrained on that date from being able to do so. However, when there wasn't a security worker in the apartment, he was able to take his fist and uh, pummel my left temple more than 15 times. So if anyone else were in that predicament, um, being diagnosed with a, con a concussion, uh, having it severely impact, impact your cognitive skills, three weeks before you walk into the room with BMP Paribas, uh, where you could, um, receive a d daily pay of 450 per day. Uh, yeah, that is a major problem. And the thing is, 
Since then, HRA has been consistently sending me notices in the mail asking me if I'm interested in earning $12.14 per hour. So how do you compare earning $12.14 per hour for a clerical position to having the opportunity to be compensated in accordance with what you've earned previously at the tune of $450 per day? So when we talk about this issue of excessive compensation with people who work for city, uh, city government agencies, I think that's pretty pertinent, isn't it? And I guess the last question um, I really have for you, well, let me just take a look at my notes here. Um, oh, yeah. So there was a, a time in July of this year in Kew Gardens when I had the opportunity to meet with DVS representatives. Um, Mr. de Blasio was there. I met with him. Mr. Banks was standing to his side. I specifically confronted him about the fact that I applied, uh, like I said, more than 20 times for jobs with the city. His answer to me was that it's a process to be granted an interview, a process. So again, if I'm supposed to be granted preferential consideration for civil service jobs, and instead of granting me an interview for jobs that would be commensurate with my experience and compensation history, I'm instead being sent notices by HRA to earn only $12.14 an hour. How seriously messed up is that? And can you guys uh, do something to intercede on my behalf, I guess? Okay. Um, I'm not going to address every single item that you raised today, uh, but I will say this. The veterans' uh, points that you receive on a civil service exam apply to the test, the civil service exam, as you know and mentioned. Um, it is not a guarantee of a job offer, but simply additional points that would give you sort of an advantage over someone like me who's not a veteran, for instance. Okay. So um, to compare the uh, three points that you'd get on a civil service exam with uh, a, a preference or non-preference of veteran hiring for an appointed position is really apples and oranges. They are not the same. A civil service position is is different than an appointed city position. Like the members of my staff are not civil servants. They don't belong to a union. They don't get points. The only points they get is if they do a good job and they're nice to me and I want to give them points. So my point is that um, the civil service positions and civil servants are different than uh, other city employees. They're all paid the same way, but different mechanisms for how they're hired and the type of prefer preferences that they receive. I don't know the 20 jobs that you applied for, to be fair. I'm sure, I'm, I know you have them, I know. I'm saying, but off the top of my head, I don't know what they are exactly. I would argue, though, that um, you have said you met with uh, DVS, right, on uh, probably. July 18th. Okay, and, uh, most recently over the summer, that they probably put you in touch with somebody at SBS, right? Is that, you did, okay. Well, they. They might have referred your information to SBS, and that's probably why you got that letter or that offer in the mail for 12, 14, and that. Is, is that a correct chronology of the, the events here? I mean, that's... I was receiving those notices before meeting with them. Okay, so you received these notices. Um, for the 20 jobs that you applied for, I mean, you have the folder, you have the file? It's across the street, okay. Um, I don't know what those positions are, but I, because I fund city agencies and I have oversight over city agencies, it would be a conflict of interest for me to call a commissioner and say, hey, hire this guy. Now, I could give you a character reference. I could say, I know this person. He's a hardworking, intelligent, honest individual, and I think he would be an asset to the company or to the agency, but I am not able to legally pressure a city agency to hire or not hire somebody. I mean, that, that would be overstepping my bounds legally. Yeah. But it's not that issue. It's the issue of simply being granted an interview, and then from that interview, make a decision on the basis, is this the person to select? I'm not even being granted an interview. Okay, so we can look into this. I'll talk to DVS on the side about this particular issue as to why you're not being called in for an interview. There is a part of SBS where they help veterans connect them to jobs that are commensurate with their experience, and I am of the opinion that this city should be doing everything it can to get veterans good-paying jobs. Nobody is opposed to that. 
Um, but maybe the jobs that you've applied for are not the best fit for you, and maybe there are others that they can help connect you with. But so. if they are the best fit for me, then uh, I guess what would the answer be? You're not entitled to an interview is what I'm trying to say. And, uh, uh, okay. So just like I'm not, I can apply to be the commissioner of baseball. They're not going to give me, and I would love to be interviewed for the job, but I'm not entitled to it. You know, I could have the, I can know all the stats. I could know all the, I could go to every game. I could be the biggest fan. I mean, like, you know, I could know people that work there, but I am not, in, just because I apply for something doesn't mean that I'm entitled to an interview. But, but, but we could find out why perhaps you weren't called for an interview and try to connect you with a job may, where you can be interviewed for. That's, that's, that is the best solution. I don't want you to take this personally. I want you to also understand this, Mr. Korematsu. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of people that apply for city jobs every single day and in every agency. And even though you have a stellar military service record, which I'm sure you do, okay, your one application, your one resume, is likely to be one of hundreds, if not thousands, of applications also for people that, many of whom are not qualified for the position, did not serve in the military, but they still have to go through all of those applications to pull out the ones that are, and then at the period when the posting is, is being taken down, they can call people in for, for interviews. I don't want you to believe that you have been discriminated against in any way in the hiring practices of the city of New York because we hire lots of people in the city who are not qualified for positions, and they somehow get jobs, including some people on the city council. So I blame... It, um, <laughs> that's unfortunately where you're wrong, because if the mayor is having these public meetings, and if I have a First Amendment right to walk through, through those doors, to engage in networking with members of the public that have the opportunity to decide, is she really representing the interests of New Yorkers best or is there someone else, perhaps? Now, that do you, can do it are, okay, you want to go to these meetings to to network, ask to, a question, or just to be a, a member of the audience? To uh, to ask a question, essentially say, these are your remarks on Veterans Day last year. How do you reconcile your own remarks with the fact that I can't be granted an interview? It's a very fair question, and you have a right to ask it, and you have a right to attend the meeting. I don't believe that the mayor's office has. Uh, put a restraining order on you in any way, they right? They have I mean, kept me out of these meetings illegally, okay. repeatedly, on different dates, different well, locations. Well, then that, that's your right. I would never interfere with your First Amendment rights, and you have... But as a council member, is there anything that you can do to, I guess, escalate the, this to the attention of DOI or the police commissioner who would have authority to see to it that laws are being complied with? We should have a conversation uh, with DVS and the mayor's office of... Uh, uh, CAU, the uh, uh, Community Affairs Unit, uh, because they are the ones that coordinate these events I've and these meetings. I've talked to them at these events, and they have blown me off. Okay, well, then that's not fair. So we, we'll have a conversation with them about the next one, and uh, Jamal uh, is raising his hand from DVS. So Because we, the mayor has a public meeting tonight, another one tomorrow. Listen, the mayor doesn't take my questions anymore either. Don't take it personally. I don't know what to tell you. Maybe because I've been attacking him for the past year and a half, but... Um, the, the point is that I, I don't want you to take any of these things right. personally. They, they, th this isn't the city of New York versus Mr. Korematsu. I don't want you to feel that way at all. The fact that you are, this is an open public meeting. You are here. You are asking questions. You are getting FaceTime with a policymaker and senior administration officials. Or yes, Nobody's trying to shut you out of, of the... I have one final question. Yeah. Um, do you have the ability to subpoena the commissioner of, of HRA to have him answer your questions under oath? Me personally, no, but the chair of that committee does. Legally, yes. We Which have committee a, is that? Uh, the uh, general, uh, welfare. general Welfare, thank you. The Committee on General Welfare, and that's Council Member Levin. So if Steve he is Levin. lying under oath when he testifies, what recourse is available There's to him? There's lots of lying that goes on in this building. This is, uh, it's unfortunate, but. But if he's sworn when he's making those statements, there should that be. Is, well, that's correct. That, look, that's a very valid point. You have a number of issues that we have to work through. Um, the first is if you want a job, I can help you point you in the right direction, and I think DVS is committed to doing the same. Uh, I can assure you that I would never, I have control over this meeting and this side of City Hall, and I would never keep anyone away. And I've had some real interesting people come to my hearings. And you know what? Every opinion counts. Everything is valid. I don't dismiss anybody. I try not to be rude. I let people air their grievances, whatever issue they're having, and we try to take people from where they're coming from. 
And so I, I just, I, I want you to know that in this room and in this place, you are being heard right now. And just one final question, I'll keep it at of that. Of course, that's um, fine, I'm not. Is there any pressure that you can put on city agencies to cancel their contracts with the same company that uh, stole my pay? So I think the pressure that can be brought to bear is, the, is during the oversight hearings, particularly during budget time, when we can ask very specific questions about programs, initiatives, and how agencies are spending money. The other way that is very helpful, and it's very helpful to me, is the press. When the media reports uh, mismanagement or, uh, or some sort of uh, mishandling of taxpayer funding by a particular agency, uh, we saw this with DHS, with some of the conditions in the shelter system. We had a big hearing, and the Daily News ran a big expose, and I, I heard that things dramatically improved uh, thereafter. So, buried uh, my story. I beg your pardon? Uh, I talked to reporters for both the New York Post and Daily News. They told me they were going to publish the story. <clears throat> Didn't appear. Well, I think you should talk to more reporters is what I'm trying to been. say. Is that the, the press is very helpful. And there's no shortage of reporters in the city who want to embarrass the city. So um, I would encourage you to continue that in the pursuit of, of justice that, that you have. I've also encouraged you in the past, and I will again, to try to get some type of legal representation. They refuse. NILAG refused. Legal Services NYC, they were not helpful. Okay, so we'll have another conversation with uh, I mean, I appreciate your assistance. I'm really, I want you to know that me and my staff and the people that work for the City Council, you're a veteran and you matter and your opinion counts for something and whatever I could do to help, I will do to help. I will never slam the door in your face. I don't ever want you to feel like you're Good wasting idea. your time. Come with me to the public town hall meeting tomorrow night and see if I'm able to walk through the front doors. What? I don't know. What? 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 Sorry, what? Uh, Wednesday night in the Bronx, R Richie Torres' town hall. Okay, let me ask you this question. Are you, Bro it may be only to open to Bronx residents. Are you a Bronx resident? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you're a Bronx resident. The mayor's going to a public meeting in the Bronx? Yeah. Are you going to blow the place up or do anything crazy? No? Okay, God willing, so... No, but his head of security, who's a defendant in a civil rights lawsuit, is among the people that won't let me into the building. Okay, so if you're not threatening to be disruptive in any way, you're not going to be... Uh, uh, but the people were just kicked out of a town hall meeting last Friday. It made the New York Post in Harlem. Okay. So if he's treating other people to... Well, I point. think maybe that's... Maybe you, you know, maybe that you want to bring a reporter with you, and if they don't allow you access, that's when the story goes in the paper the next day. They w the Post would love a story like that. Mm. I think they, they like any story that uh, sells papers. So um, my point is this. Let's see if we could be helpful offline, <coughs> and Jamal will have a little conversation, the three of us. That concludes today's hearing. I want to thank everyone for coming, the administration, for their testimony today. And do we have a date for the next hearing? Do we have a date yet? Not yet, Not yet but we will announce that uh, hopefully soon. The meeting is adjourned. Which, which organization are you from again? Um, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America? But yeah, your testimony was really good. <laughs>